Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight's video has been graciously sponsored by Skillshare. This amazing platform offers a variety of online classes on literally anything you can think of. And given the current situation that we're all going through, I think it is a really great time to just start learning anything you want. Brush up on an old skill, or maybe something that you might want to pick up. It's a great learning opportunity. Just go nuts. I personally have been practicing my poi thanks to Skillshare for the past few months with the help of Ben Drexler. He's a really awesome flow artist. And if you're into flow arts, seriously good. Check him out. The first 1000 people who click the link as the pin comment and in the description will get two months for free. That's plenty of time to binge on pretty much anything you want. So go nuts. Thanks guys. But for now it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I was almost killed six years ago by a friend, and it dabbles into the paranormal at times. This took years for me to be able to talk about. I'm still dealing with PTSD associated with the event. Six years ago, myself and a male friend called Sam decided we wanted to go camping. I'd known him for years and he was one of my best friends. So I wasn't weirded out by going camping alone with him. But I decided to invite a girlfriend along. The more the merrier. Rita. So we decided to go camping at this spot. I hadn't been to that particular one in a couple of years, but I still remembered the basic general directions to get there. We stopped at a gas station outside their last tiny town and asked to make sure we were going the right way, to which the attendant pointed and said, follow the storm. And sure enough, huge black clouds are formed in the direction of our campsite. I mean, this was, to date, the most terrifying storm that I had ever seen. What's a story without a crazy storm, right? So we sit in the car and discuss going home, but being the badasses that we are, we decide to tough it out. We all like camping in the rain during storms. Now, we start driving on this dirt road in the middle of nowhere. And as we're getting closer to the campsite, I start getting this horrible feeling. Just horrible. There's no way to explain it. Other than I knew something bad was going to happen. We eventually decide to turn around, because the storm was that bad. The lightning was hitting right outside our car, and it seemed way too dangerous. So we start heading back towards town, and the second we leave the forest, boom, no storm. Okay, well if the storm is localised in this area, we'll go camp elsewhere. About 20 minutes from our town, there is a reservoir with a man-made lake and a few camping spots in various spots. So we park there, pick up our stuff, and start on the trail that runs around the lake so that we can find a spot with more privacy. The spot where we parked our car was right at the opening of the trail, and a couple of cars were camped at the spot right there. We stopped and chatted casually with them. They seemed pretty cool, so we invited them to head out our way in about an hour, after we'd set up shop and we'd all play games and drink together. We get to our spot and set up camp, and I randomly get a text message on my phone from another friend. This was weird because cell service is super shoddy out in this area. She is an artist friend of mine, whose stars have risen greatly in the last few years. I explain where we are, and she says, great, I've been looking for a really big fire recently. I'm on my way. Kind of an odd statement, but artists are strange people, and she smokes a lot of weed. 
so I don't really understand half of what she says. So, let's fast forward time here for the sake of the story. We are having a great time. The other couples come over and we're drinking and having a blast and my artist friend shows up with this monstrosity of a statue. She said that she made it in her college freshman art class and it brought her horribly bad luck for four years and she wants to burn it. I wish to God I had some sort of bad feeling about it, but I'm not really one to believe in supernatural or weird things. So we all laugh and throw it in the fire. Fast forward a couple of hours. My artist friend brought her weed out and smoked with my friend Sam for a few hours. Now Sam is mixing liquor and weed. Rita and I don't smoke and it starts getting dark. And the new couple heads towards their camp. And my artist friend decides to head home as she was not planning to spend the night. So, it was just the original trio left. At about this time, Sam is starting to act very weird. We laughed it off as Cross faded, which nearly cost me my life. It started off with his voice changing. It went from normal to very low, dark and gravelly. He sounded like a totally different person. Once again, we just think that he's a bit screwed up. Then it gets worse. He starts babbling nonsense. It started off pretty quietly, but got more and more understandable. He pulled Rita aside and told her he worked for the CIA, had millions of dollars in offshore accounts, and could make any of us disappear in an instant and get away with it with no issue. Please keep in mind, this is one of my absolute best friends, and I've never felt the least bit scared around him. We just laugh off the veiled threats. Haha, <laughs> okay, drumcast. Around this time, Rita notices that her hatching that we were using for firewood had gone missing. We searched everywhere, but it was just too dark. We give it up as a lost cause until sunup. Sam is still muttering dark nonsense to himself, sitting on the opposite side of the fire pit alone. Eventually he passed out, and Rita and I stayed up chuckling about how weird he'd acted, and congratulated ourselves on a pretty fun night. About an hour later, we start to feel raindrops and the damn storm we'd driven to avoid is getting ready to dump on our heads. Oh well, it's late. We'll get drunky in the tent and go to bed. This is where it gets real. We shake him gently until he moans and we explain that it's starting to rain and that it's time to get to bed. He struggles up and Rita and I each grab a side and haul him in the tent. We stop in front of the tent to unzip it, and he goes nuts. Totally out of this world, possessed by the devil himself. I'm not even being dramatic about this. He starts screaming this horrible high-pitched sound. One, I'll never be able to get out of my nightmares. I was bent over, so I missed the swing that Rita gets thrown to the other side of the camp. He turns around. Gracefully, I might add. Driven stupor gradually gone, and kicks out the last coals from the fire. This is happening in a matter of seconds, but time was slowed down for me. I remember every tiny detail. So the fire is out, the campsite is 100% pitch black. No moon because of the storm clouds. Next thing I know, Sam is standing next to me, so close I can feel him breathing, and then all of a sudden I'm on the ground. I hit hard enough for the air to be knocked out of me. Not that I'd be able to breathe anyway, because Sam was sitting on my stomach, with his hands wrapped very tightly around my throat. He was strangling me 
with all of his very significant strength. Now Sam is one of those super tall muscular types that have crazy long monkey arms. I'm reaching up to try and push him off me, as his arms were so long that I couldn't even touch his chest. I was scraping at his arms and bucking underneath him, trying to get him off me. I can hear Rita screaming my name, trying to find out where I am, but at this point I'm blacking out. It seemed like an eternity, but in reality it was probably no more than a few minutes. Through my fading vision I see Rita, punching and fighting Sam, trying her hardest to get him to let go. She's a rugby player, so she's pretty scrappy. I black out for a few minutes. I only have Rita's version of the story. But after I go limp, she understandably freaks out and assumes that he's killed me. She goes into overdrive and starts kneeing him in the face. Eventually, she hits him enough times to stun him enough to make him let go. And she pushes him aside and hauls me up, still unconscious, and seriously thought I was dead. And dead weight is no easy thing. Go, Rita. I guess I was out for a couple of minutes, but when I come to, she's dragging me down the path, crying quietly. I come to pretty much full force, and am immediately on freakout mode. Hysterics, naturally. Screaming, crying, shaking uncontrollably. And Rita is telling me to hush. That Sam hadn't followed us, but we certainly didn't want him to start. I managed to control myself a little, and I managed to start carrying my own weight to walk. Now, to add insult to injury, my flip-flops had fallen off during the attack, and I was now walking barefoot on a horribly rocky path. This was not pleasant, and I could feel the cuts. So Rita, being the badass she is, takes off her sandals and puts them on my feet. Seriously, this girl, Jesus. So, from our campsite to the parking lot was about 15 minutes, but probably longer with my recent trauma, but it was still silent behind us. So, it seemed that Sam had been left behind. When we were close enough to the new couple's camp, which was right behind the parking lot, we started screaming for help. The girl, being reasonably frightened, stays in the tent, but the guy comes out to the path to find out what was wrong. We explain the whole attack slash almost died situation, and he pulls out a gun with the intention of walking back to our campsite. Luckily, his girlfriend comes out at this point and convinces him that instead of a murder charge, it would be better instead to get us to cell service so that we can dial 911. We're walking towards their car when we realize there's a camp manager a couple of hundred yards away. Perfect. We head towards that. Knock on the door, cry hysterically, and explain what was going on. A very nice lady gets us bottles of water while her husband calls the police. They sit us down on their couch to wait, and for some reason, I still remember seeing that there were five deadbolts on the door. He wasn't getting through that door. About half an hour later, about a dozen cops and an ambulance are there. The cops take our story and head up to find Sam asking us if he's armed. We say that we didn't know. They explain the missing hatchet and my knife in the purse. So they go out armed. Rita and I are loaded into the ambulance and an officer comes to the door before it closes and state that they found Sam. He was still at the campsite, completely naked, bleeding from the minor wounds Rita had inflicted, holding the hatchet and laughing. The officer said he was mumbling about being possessed by the devil and spouting utter nonsense. The officer asked if he had done any drugs and we'd said that he'd smoked weed and drank. Could the weed have been laced? I doubt it. My artist friend didn't become possessed by Satan that night. The rest is fairly dull. My first ever ambulance ride. A very pricey emergency visit. A lot of drugs. CT scans to check for internal swelling in my neck. 
and they wanted to keep me overnight, but there was no way I was going to let that happen. My cat is my therapy animal, and he was home. I was going home. End of story. To add insult to injury, when I got home, I realised that because I'd been having roommate troubles, I'd locked my bedroom door with my cat inside, and my keys were still at the campsite. I could hear him meowing through the door while I just sold my eyes out, locked on the outside. I was too loaded up on drugs to go anywhere. So Rita, in a final spur of awesomeness, went with her mother, who worked with abused women and helped me through many a panic attack after, went out and retrieved all my stuff. All of us are at 24 hours of no sleep. That's the story. The rest is just obvious stuff. Charges, prosecution, court, and a lot of physical and mental anguish. He pleaded guilty. The judge asked him if he wanted to make a statement. He didn't. I never got an apology for almost ending my life. Sometimes there's no definite closure. I never believed in bad luck, superstition, possession, or any of that stuff. But I am 100% positive burning that stupid statue is what caused him to snap that night. He wasn't a dangerous person. He never had been violent before. The statue did something. It brought my artist friend bad luck and clearly had some bad spirit in it that we let go. That's the most detailed account that I've ever given about this incident. I love waking up in the dark and walking the sunrise with my dogs. I didn't intend to own two huskies in a German Shepherd mix, but they each found me and I couldn't turn them away. We usually jog about five miles daily, often in the neighborhood, but nearly as often, I load us up into the van and drive 10 minutes to the wooded metro path. I love it there. They offer some trails that allow quads and motorbikes, some cycles and skis, some just people. And last year they opened a new one that allows pets. It's a five mile loop into the area farthest from the city. We live on the northern edge of town, but in the dark, with no leaves on the trees, you can clearly see the red glow of the CVS sign for most of the hike. These are tamed woods with asphalt paths and concrete fire pits and rangers patrolling regularly. And the hospital behind CVS means there's emergency medical care in walking distance. I was up coughing again in the night. I had a serious case of pneumonia two months ago and was not fully recovered when this sinus infection hit me. I'm past the fever part. So we're walking again, but not yet jogging. But after being up in the night, I didn't get up in time to go walk before I dropped my kids off at school. Then my youngest had an appointment and then I had to run a few errands. And then we had unexpected visitors right after school. And then they stayed for dinner. And finally, I got the dogs into the van and we made it to the park just before it got dark. I was irritated at all the little things that had kept me from my walk all day. But as we drove all the way to the back of the park, I realized we'd be walking the sunset, watching it over the lake and the hills and throughout the bare trees. As the park was clearing out now, as it started to get dark, we may very nearly have the place to ourselves and might not have to pull off the path to let others pass us. An amazing number of people who are afraid of dogs hike the pet path. 
All those little irritations had led up to this singular moment of beauty. I would not otherwise have been able to appreciate. This was going to be a really good walk. Funny how life works out when you let it. I parked in my spot at the furthest end of the parking lot by the bathrooms. A mile long path looped through the woods and by the lake and came out by the bathrooms. I liked to run it when I came here alone, as that one was walkers or jogging only. It was a glorious walk through a Bob Ross painting. My mind cleared and my thoughts quieted and I simply experienced the woods. My feet on the path, my dogs panting, the nature sounds, the beauty of the sky, I absolutely loved it. About halfway now, and the city sounds had faded away until I could only hear the birds, the frogs, and insects all singing their songs of territory and mating and life. When there was a crack, breaking the utter silence and absolute stillness, my dogs and I turned instantly towards the source of the sound and froze. Behind us and to the right, the sound had come from the crest of a hill. I could see nothing and heard only the dogs panting. I waited for the nature sounds to return, but they did not. All three of the dogs slowly raised their ruffs fur standing on end around their shoulders and neck, tails held tall and proud, making themselves look larger and more threatening. I took a step towards them, and the female husky, the leader of my little pack, instantly put her ears back and her head down and pulled me to the path. All three of them left their tails and ruffs up, but the two males also put their ears back and heads down and began to pull me. So off we went. The woods were still silent. We must have startled a buck on the slope of the hill and not seen him. And after we passed, he leapt up the hill and jumped a dead tree and his hoof hit a dead branch and the branch broke, crack and scared everyone. Why were the woods still silent though? Maybe there was someone up there. Homeless people stay here sometimes. The bathrooms have heat, so the pipes don't freeze. This is about as far out as the path goes. It would be a good place to sleep. Maybe he's getting up a shelter and a crack broke the branch. Why were the woods still silent though? We were about as far away from the city as we could get in these woods, and you couldn't see the CVS sign, or the glow from the streetlights, or even hear the traffic noises. We were deep. It was dark, and still, and absolutely quiet, except for the panting dogs and four sets of footsteps on the path. I wanted to run. The dogs wanted to run. It must have been a Bigfoot breaking a log, telling me to get out. But there are no Bigfoot in city limits. I promise you that, Brain. It was a deer. The woods are still quiet because of us. I have 200 pounds of dog here. They're all big huskies. And another 200 pounds of me. Yeah, I'm a little fat, but I've got good muscle underneath. I have broad shoulders that don't fit into women's shirts, and big hands that don't fit into women's gloves, and can lift a hundred pounds over my head. We are the scariest thing in the woods. There are no bear, there are no wolves, and no Bigfoot. There are deers, there are foxes, and there might be an angry raccoon, 
But we are the biggest, baddest, scariest thing here. Unless there's someone with a gun, my mind says. Shut up, you're not helping, Brain. The dogs had not stopped once to sniff or mark. Heads down, ears back, tails and ruffs still held high. They just wanted to go. We'd gone almost a mile now, me craning my head the whole time, trying to see as far as I could in all directions, while letting the dogs pull me down the path. And it was still absolutely silent. Not an overflying goose, not a cricket. Nothing moved. Nothing made a sound. Except us. Here came the third and longest of the three steep hills on the trail. I had been running these to rebuild my strength and endurance. But if I ran this, I'd be blown at the top. The top where it curved around as it crested and you couldn't see anything past the thick trees. The top, where if you were deeper in the woods, you could follow a more gradual ridge up to the crest of the hill and wait, unseen for someone to come up the path. Ambush. It was a deer. Turn around. It was just a deer. But what if it's behind us? It's an ambush. Is it a deer? Do they have a gun? And this is why I ran. The noises in my head were unbearable. Up the hill, I walked. I pay attention and I watch the dogs. They were still on alert, but did not hesitate to go up the hill. In fact, they wanted to go faster. Just walk, don't get smoked. Be able to run or fight if you have to. I'm scared. The woods should not be silent. The dog should not still be on alert. It's not a cat or a bear or a wolf, and I really doubt it's a Bigfoot. It could be a person. So let's be smart, just walk. We are not good prey. The dogs will protect me. The huskies might not alone, but the shepherd will, and they will follow his lead. Be smart, get out. All I could think to myself. There was only another mile now until the lake and the first parking lot. Then another half mile along the lake to the second lot, where my van was. Hearing traffic noises now, but still no birds, no crickets and no frogs. The smell almost stopped me in my tracks, but the dogs kept pulling. Sour and grassy and oddly metallic. And shit, shit and blood and partially digested grass. I smelled the contents of a deer's stomach. Someone hunted in these woods. And the dogs were not interested in the smell. We ran. I don't remember much of that last mile. We just ran. Denza, the big female husky, finally stopped to drink some lake water as we came out by the parking lot. Then she began to sniff and pee, the boys following her lead. There was a single truck parked. I relaxed quite a bit, but still felt on edge. Down the lake in the parking lot, I could see headlights. They must be parked at the turnaround at the end of the lot closest to the lake, as they illuminated the lakeside path. They were watching us. Halfway to the van now, and the car drove away. Twenty feet from the van, I heard a motor coming down the nearest path. I decided to put the dogs in the car on the driver's side instead of the passenger's side like normal. The sound of the motor came closer. The leashes caught on the armrest, and I had to untangle them before the dogs could jump into the van. The motor came closer down the path. I had to be gone before it came out. I knew it with absolute certainty. Finally, the dogs were in. I slammed the door and jumped in the front, fumbling for the lock button, shaking hands, unclipping the keys from my jogging belt and starting the car and gunning it into reverse. And as my headlights swept over the entrance of the path by the bathrooms, they lit up a four-wheeler. 
coming out of the woods. I was dropping the transmission into drive and hitting the gas. And as my brain processed what my eyes saw, it informed me that there was something across the handlebar. A gun? A deer carcass? I couldn't tell because of the angle when pulling away. I couldn't see him in the rearview mirror. Very early on a cool, dark, moonless morning in November, I eat breakfast quickly with the friends I'm camping with, and hop into my car to head to my hunting spot. We're bow hunting in southern Ohio, an annual tradition, camped on a high bluff in sight of the Ohio River. On chilled fall nights, with a blanket of stars above us, and a fire pushing a cloud of smoke to the sky, we can see the lights from barges moving slowly up and down the river. At this place, for four days, we are in a different world, hundreds of miles from the bustling and familiar cities we've come from. Not that these thousands of acres of woods aren't becoming more familiar over the years, but what brings us back is the unknown. I drive out of the camp alone, down a paved road for several miles, then turn north away from the river, up a dirt road meandering through one of the thousands of hollows rippled across this landscape. I'm exiting cellular service, rolling along a winding road following a creek bottom, a deep valley with a large hill ascending on both sides. But I can see nothing but the grey glow of the gravel, and the trees and shadows dancing in my headlights. I pull off the road as far as I dare, and park an empty gear from the car. All is quiet as possible. Everything from this point is prepared and navigated with the light of my headlamp, set to the dimmest setting. I close the car door with a gentle nudge, avoiding any sound that would intrude too deeply into the forest. Before the hike, I pause breathe in the cool fall air, and assess my surroundings. Totally black, and with very little wind. Dead quiet. I'll have to be exceptionally silent on my way to avoid detection. I stalk down a hill, and cross the shallow creek, each step slow and deliberate, feet searching first for any stick that might snap under my weight. Carefully, I wind through a narrow trail that I've partially trimmed through the impassable thicket of briars and brush that runs along the creek. At the base of a tree, I prepare a stand, used to ascend the tree for the hunt. Inching my way up the tree, I see nothing but the blackness, watching only the texture of the bark pass directly in front of my face. Once in position, at about 20 feet, all activity stops, and I disappear back into the silence of the woods. Every few minutes a sip of coffee, just as the sky begins to provide enough light for me to see my surroundings, shooting light it's called, well, before the morning sun will appear, I hear a crackling and rustling ahead from down the hill, at maybe 150 yards. Is it a deer? If so, it's running. But why? During the November rut, whitetail bucks are known to chase does for long distances through the woods, desperate for a breeding opportunity. I've seen this dozens of times. Something about this is different though. And the closer it comes, the less familiar it seems. Only several seconds pass and the animal is in sight. Or maybe it's more appropriate to say that the exact location of the sound is now apparent, because I can't determine what I am seeing, or if I am seeing anything at all. I can hunt for weeks without the satisfaction of a deer passing by my stand, but oddly enough, this thing is heading right to my location, 
at a speed that's making me uncomfortable. The creek bottom begins its topography up the hill, with a very steep if not vertical wall of rocks. There is very little vegetation here, a few leaves collected in the fissures. I finally perceive the creature crest this drop off, and this is at my eye level. I'm 20 feet up a tree. But before I can make it, it's already descended the feature at full speed, and it's heading right to me. Now it's just light enough that I can describe any leaf on the forest floor, but I can only describe the source of the noise as a bodiless, translucent whirl of brown and grey and black, as though I can see right through it, moving in a perfectly straight line, too straight, along the forest floor at extremely high speed. The coffee and the hike have ensured that I have my wits about me, and I'm suddenly struck with the thought that whatever this thing is, it may climb this tree. Anything that can slice through the forest as though trees and rocks and everything else doesn't exist can surely climb a tree, or perhaps jump the full distance. My chest is slammed with adrenaline in the split second that I watch it cruising from the bottom of the hill towards me. My pulse booms in my ears. The intensity of terror peaks as it arrives. There has been no time. I am not prepared. They say a mountain lion will watch you, you'll never know it's there, and if it decides to kill you, it will be in a split second. We delude ourselves to believe that the unexpected may be manageable to some degree, that we could make the decision to prevent disaster. This is often false. There are forces in creation that are not only overpowering and unpredictable, they are nearly instantaneous. Staring helplessly, I watch this devil pass under, almost touching the tree. Thank God for this tree. Never does it reveal itself. Always a blur, a violent storm of leaves, a ghost, never an animal. Only a presence. It rushes past and pierces through the thickest brush imaginable. Down through the creek, never slowing, never acknowledging the seven inch bank of the creek never changing course, at absolutely supernatural speed. Same as it came, but in the opposite direction. I listen to the sticks and vegetation mark its terrible progress until the sound became distant, and then it was no more. Terrain that would take a man 15 minutes to traverse, if at all, was covered in seconds. A heavy chill runs through my body. And although this sense of dread abates a little, I'm overcome with a heavy eeriness. A feeling of having encountered something unexplainable. Supernatural. No, of course not. It was a coyote or a bobcat or a fox. Yes, that's probably what it was. My mind is desperate to make sense of it. I turn to the rock wall along the hill. Can the animal I know descend a wall like that? Maybe. But would they? And if they did, wouldn't I be able to see them? Yes. Does any animal run that fast? I don't think so. This is unusual. I sit in the tree motionless, sedate and tingling, trying to reconcile. I look up the creek to a thick, brushy meadow along the shaded bottoms to the north. A fog hovers over all in silence, the woods filled with a hypnotic and isolated beauty. I gaze for some time, and slowly the sun crests the hill to the east, causing a few beams to the top of the fog, and the golden leaves remain on the trees. Gradually the shadows retreat, and daylight moves into the forest, I saw no other creatures that day. As most teenagers are, I was pretty reckless with my own safety. I knew about people being taken, 
and people being killed. But I thought I was invincible, and doubted anything would ever happen to me. At the same time, I was quite receptive, paranoid, and aware of my surroundings. Just not educated enough. Being this naive comes with its fair share of dangerous situations. From ages 12 to 17, I preferred to go out in the dark. It felt more exciting. I would frequently go out for long walks with my best friend, who is a year younger than me. And if I wasn't with her, I'd tell my mom I was, so that she wouldn't worry. We never really had specific destinations, I just loved to walk. And, at the later stages, despite my previous experiences, I would walk town to town, frequenting particular benches or deserted places. Stupid, I know. This experience I shared with my friend when I was around 14, and her 13. One of our regular daytime spots was a well-known area of my town, hard to miss. Huge chalk hills and woods, with miles of fields and farm. A very strange sight amongst the businesses, homes, council estates, miles of roads and shopping centres surrounding it. As you can imagine, a beautifully quiet place to visit, to get away from the rush and mounds of other humans and instead watch it from afar. It tended to only be dog walkers and the occasional jogger that frequented these areas, and apart from teenage parties, which were few and far between in this area of the hills, I'd never heard of much crime occurring here. One evening, we walked to a park we liked to chill in. I cringe thinking about this place too. It was huge and fenced in behind lines of houses, and was locked at a certain time each night. It was the most remote and lesser known park in an area that had many of a similar size, mostly due to being hard to find, and it held an even lesser known passage to the hills. We hung around in the park for a bit in the darkness of winter got bored, and decided that we would go for a stroll across the fields, maybe even try to get into our little den that we had built there one summer, for some much desired adrenaline. From past experiences going with groups, there were rarely ever people there after dark. Probably because it wasn't very well lit. We took the path and joked around on the field under the hills, wandering around, when we noticed a short, stocky man with a limp in the distance. I instantly got a strange feeling about him, and it wasn't my usual fight-or-flight anxiety I got with your regular human. It was pure, get your little ass down that path and to somewhere safe anxiety. He seemed to stop, and turn around, and walk a bit, and then turn back towards us and walk a bit closer, then change his mind, over and over, and then he stopped again, and turned towards us, and as if on a mission, headed in our direction. We headed straight for the path. We started slow, nervously giggling, and looked behind ourselves, and realised this man was really gaining despite his limp. It just didn't feel right at this point, so we ran. We ran through the unlit park, which at this point had a multitude of bats flying across, just to add to the allure of it, and we looked behind us. He was still following. When we were at the gate exiting, he just started to cross the grass. Now this wasn't the only way to the main road, it was muddy and dark, and occasionally locked, but in our worry I don't even think that crossed our minds. Looking back, most rational thinking adults probably wouldn't go this way behind two little girls. They'd follow the path that went around the outside one instead. We went this way, 
because to us it seemed the quickest, and already in an unsafe situation. It didn't seem as dangerous as this stranger catching up. We ran down the road, crossed the traffic lights and slowed down. We were next to a pub so we felt safe. We rationalised it. I mean, it could be a coincidence, as he was just walking in the same direction as us. But at the same time, we still wanted to get home without him knowing where we lived. So we continued forward at a fair pace. Again looking back as we walked, this man was still staggering after us, and he looked tired. Why didn't he slow down or stop? Nothing added up. We were down a dark empty road, and were unnerved once again. It was about three quarters of a mile until we got to some 24 hour shop, so we decided we would run it. The sooner we were around with other people, the better. We just about made it to a shop, hid behind a passport photo machine, and looked towards the road where we'd left the man behind. In these few seconds, I felt rational again, and imagined that he would just continue his rushed walk all the way to his home. But instead, he stopped at the crossing and inspected the roads. He was looking for us, and looked every way we could have gone. He was searching for something, and it certainly wasn't a car. He decided on a street, and as fast as he could drag his dodgy leg, he attempted to trail after us. Me and my mate were shaken. We couldn't understand why he was following us, but we knew that he almost certainly was. After a few minutes, we decided to try and confirm what was happening, and peeked down the road he went down. We could see him clearly annoyed, looking down each side road and turning in circles, desperately looking for a sign of where we went. We left him there, and hurried home in the opposite direction, only taking the main roads. The next day at school, we told the story to our friends at lunchtime, and everyone agreed it was weird. He must have followed us at least one and a half miles in the end, which was a long distance. Just for comical value, although reasonably irrelevant, I'll add that just as lunch ended, a janitor with a strikingly similar limp and of same body type walked into the cafeteria. Myself and my friends just looked at each other, and for a short while convinced ourselves that it was him. We still talk about it now, and wonder what his intentions were. I wonder more about what he would have done if he had caught up to us at the shops or pub. I most likely now think he was just trying to scare us, either because that made him feel something, or because he wanted us to not endanger ourselves like that again. But I think that just might be my naivety shining through. I can't say I was a lot more careful after that experience, but I am glad to still be here, and much more educated and aware now. All I can say is, I never went back to those hills after dark, and wouldn't recommend it, either. I work as a broadcast engineer, and a few years ago, I received a phone call at around 9.30 10pm from the on-duty engineer that our over-the-air signal had gone out, and we were off the air on our over-the-air platform. We figured out that the problem was at our transmitter, and needed to be corrected manually. My boss asked for someone to volunteer to go with him, and after a few seconds of awkward silence, I offered. So, our RF transmitter site was located on top of Beacon Mountain, in Beacon, New York, which was about an hour plus from our station. At the time, I had never been up there, 
So going there in the middle of the night was a little spooky. I met my boss and we drove together and got to the mountain a little before midnight. The road up the mountain to the transmitter site is a long, narrow, windy and steep dirt road with a lot of big, loose rocks. So the drive up and down is scary enough. I can't emphasize enough how dark this drive was, like pitch black. A few times while going up, we could see headlights coming towards us of people with their off-road jeeps, which wouldn't be as weird if it wasn't in the middle of the night. We also saw two different campfires in the woods, which I just assumed were local groups hanging out and drinking. My boss told me that locals hung out near the transmitter site sometimes and should be avoided as they had a tendency to be sketchy. Didn't seem too sketchy to me, but what did I know? It was my first time there. My boss also told me that he never travels to the mountain without a gun. He said it's more than the locals. I've seen stuff out there I really can't explain. We get to the top, do our work on our transmitter, close everything up, and start to head back down. As we're heading down, we were at a particularly steep part of the road, when you pretty much have to ride your brake, because the car won't stop until the incline levels are out a little. All of a sudden, three deer sprint out in front of us, not even looking at our oncoming car, causing us to swerve since we were already riding the brake. The front of the car hit a rock, which stopped our momentum. My boss instantly turned off the car, and once the sound of the engine died, we heard something big run in the opposite direction away from the road, up the natural slope of the hill. I shined my flashlight in that direction, but whatever it was, was already out of sight. We could still see branches moving and leaves settling from being disturbed by whatever ran away. I asked my boss if he thought that was another deer, or possibly a bear. He replies, bears run on all fours. Whatever that was, ran on two legs. And bears don't hunt deer. Something was chasing them. When we first heard the footsteps, I would estimate that they were as close as 10 to 15 feet from the car when it started to run away, but appeared to be standing over us as if there was a natural incline up the mountain. There are a lot of logical explanations, like that my boss was trying to scare me, or that it was a local walking slash running through the woods, but here are a few things to consider. Yes, it could have been a person walking alone through the woods, but why chase deer? And why run away from the car? Also, whatever ran away was out of sight quickly, within three to four seconds running uphill. This person would have had to have been in the greatest shape ever to run up the hill that quickly. This also sounded way too big to be a bobcat, mountain lion, or coyote. My boss is not the kind of guy that would try to scare people. He's a very stern or business type of guy. He seemed pretty rattled by this and wanted to get off the mountain ASAP. I ended up going back up that mountain many more times before leaving for a new job. And I never saw or heard anything like that night. However, I never went back after sunset. I no longer work for this company, and this company no longer owns the transmitter site, so I will likely never have a reason to go back. I don't know of any reported sightings or experiences in the area, but I do know that over the years there have been many car accidents on the road. I assume all the accidents are due to the poor conditions of it, but honestly, I have no idea. This happened a little over two years ago. I'm a 31-year-old male, 5 foot 11, 
and was pretty athletic in shape at the time. I worked out, went running, and ate right. The city I live in has about 300,000 people. There are tons of parks and forests with hiking trails all throughout the city itself. And the city is pretty much surrounded by woods and farmland past that. It was fall time during the year. And occasionally, on my days off from work, I like to load up my backpack, just grab my stuff for a kind of urban hike and take off walking across the city, hiking through a bunch of different trails and parks along the way, stopping and grabbing coffees at cafes, beer at pubs, and doing whatever just floated my boat. Those were the days. Sometimes I would take my dog with me too. But on this particular day, I had taken off and left them at home. I remember loading up my backpack as usual. Sometimes I would take my dogs with me too, but on this particular day I had taken off and left them at home. I remember loading up my backpack as usual, rolling a couple of joints up to take for the journey and getting ready for leaving. For the entire week, it had been raining nonstop. And with it being so late in the year, somewhere around October, it made it pretty cold outside even though there wasn't snow on the ground yet. I put on my winter jacket and hat, but still kept on my hiking athletic type shoes instead of any kind of boot. And I had already walked across most of the entire length of the city into the side where it would be the town exactly opposite from where I live. This area is not especially nice, but I've never had any problems or bad experiences myself even living in the area for a few years beforehand. On the very edge of this place is a big nature conservatory that basically runs along the outer edge of the city. So I start hiking in this area of trails after maybe 10 to 15 minutes of hiking, and I decide to blaze up one of my smokes. I walk along listening to jazz through my headphones when I finally finish my joint. I've seen no one else out at this point, which is expected, as it's a bit damp and cold. But after maybe five minutes from finishing up my smoke, I turn around a bend of trees and see another guy walking down the same trail as myself. It's maybe 45 seconds until we pass each other. I turn down my music and get a good look at this guy. He looked homeless, which isn't too uncommon in this area but he had mostly gray hair with still some spots of brown, but dramatically thinning even though it ran down to his shoulders, and a patchy beard that was colored the same. He had a green type jacket on and some dirty jeans, just looking like a dirty alcoholic and rather unpleasant in general. But who am I to judge? The guy looks annoyed, and as we're getting closer to each other, even though I'm looking directly at him. He never makes eye contact with me the whole time. He looks like he's almost mumbling or pouting or saying something under his breath. But as we finally pass each other, he still doesn't acknowledge me. So I didn't feel the need to say anything either and just kept going my way. I don't really think too much about it and continue walking. But before he turns around, the bend of trees that I had just come from. I turn my head back towards his direction and take a look at him, only to see him doing the same to me already, as he's still walking. Our eyes connect, and I don't break eye contact even though we're about 40 yards away from each other now. I'm just kind of like, hmm, weird, as I continue to walk and turn my music back up. The more I think about him, the more I weird myself out. But then I tell myself that I'm being paranoid because I'm high and continue to go about my business. I'm hiking along for about another 10 minutes or so, listening to jazz really loudly in my headphones packed underneath my thick winter cap when I'm walking along a part of the path and trail where it's a little steeper of a decline off to my right. 
about a little 10 foot muddy hill type drop. I remember listening to John Coltrane, so the songs are really long. And it was just by luck that a song had just ended. And there were a brief few seconds of silence before the next song played. When all of a sudden I heard footsteps running behind me. I span around to my left as fast as possible, when the guy from before was directly on top of me. What happened next seemed like it all happened in a matter of seconds. But just fortunately, it seemed like I was in the zone when it occurred. As I spun around to my left turning around, the man was there immediately. I basically grabbed him by the shoulder with one arm and his coat with the other and we both go over the edge of the trail down the slope. I remember rolling down the slope completely twice on my shoulder, still backpacking everything on and somehow landed on my knees and was able to get into a sprinter's position and run right out on the landing. Already running at full speed by the time even got back up, I didn't even hesitate and look back as I bolted in a straight line through everything. At first, landing and running, I was maybe 15 yards away when I heard the man yell twice to stop. The area that we had fallen down into was basically a muddy wet marsh after all the rain. I didn't look back once. I was sprinting as fast as I could for about 10 to 15 minutes before I ran into a chain link fence separating someone's backyard from the nature preserve. I hopped in and kept running three to four blocks back into a residential area and further away from the wooded one. Finally, I stopped and caught my breath before I called up a buddy who lived nearby and had him come and collect me. After we got back to his place, I explained what happened and he pointed out the shoulder and backpack of my jacket were completely ripped from the top, almost as if he could have had a knife and just cut my jacket as I turned around at the last second. Or it could have been when I rolled down the hill too, I don't know. Either way, I hope to never see that psycho or experience anything similar to this again. From 2012 to 13, I did a lot of hiking in and around the coastal range in Oregon. I frequently would go out by myself for days and come into town to restock on food if necessary. It was commonplace for me when I was in town to spend the whole day hiking back the four hours to where I was camping at dusk. The trail I took wasn't well traveled and looked more like a deer path than anything. I had chosen my campsite for its lack of foot traffic and its serenity, avoiding conventional locations. I had only a cell phone on me during this period of hiking and camping, and no bright clothing. No GPS tracking device and or emergency beacon. Probably wasn't the smartest idea looking back. There were times that I heard and saw things while out in the forest that I didn't recognize by sight and or sound but nothing came close to the incident I had in May of 2013. I had done my usual restock in a small town some six miles from where I had decided to camp for the night, and I spent the day in town as usual. I started walking back to my camp location about dusk. Half of the walk, I chose to use dirt roads until veering off on the deer trail I used earlier in the day. By this time, it was completely dark, but it was clear out and possible to see the trail still using the moonlight. I don't listen to headphones while hiking. I've always thought it's wiser to be able to hear whatever is around you in case there is a predator, whether human, animal, or whatever. I was mentally doing some calculations for the next day's hike, when my mind is literally stopped mid-track. I hadn't heard anything, and I don't make hardly any sound when hiking. If I had heard something, 
I would have known. For some reason, be it a sixth sense or survival instinct, I'm not sure, I was jolted quite suddenly, out of thought, and very aware of the fact that I wasn't alone on this trail. What was odd to me especially, is even though I had heard nothing whatsoever, I knew acutely that something was behind me, specifically about 30 yards down the trail. I still to this day have so many unanswered questions about how I knew this. Standing really still, I turned around and looked down the trail. I didn't see anything, but I felt it. It honestly really is difficult to pin down how to describe what I felt, because I hadn't felt that way before or since. It was straight up fight or flight, and my logical mind was saying there's nothing out of the ordinary, while my senses were saying to get the hell out of there. Again, looking back and remembering this, I have no idea what to say. This is really hard to explain. It was like I was being taunted, and I felt it. The presence of something, or someone, was down the trail. And for some reason, I knew that it knew that I knew it was there, even though I couldn't see it. That's what still scares me to this day. It knew, and it was bright enough for me to see down the trail 30 yards back, no problem. There wasn't anything on the trail, and I will swear by it. It was like I was being taunted, or beckoned to come closer. This was maybe 30 seconds into looking down the trail, if that. I was panicking, but I still wasn't sure what to think, because I still wasn't seeing anything threatening. So I turned around, and started walking at a quick pace. I didn't know what else to do. I knew that if in fact a guy was out to kill me, he was probably going to end up killing me, on this trail or in my tent after following me back to it. So why run was my logical thought. I would say that I wasn't even a minute into the trek back, that I heard what can only be described as a sound like rushing or swooping air, followed by what seemed like a rake sliding across the dirt trail, the former sound happening right after the latter. These sounds happened together, like half a second apart, four times, and they were very close, maybe 20 yards back. Looking back now, I don't know how I was able to stay composed, and not soil myself. But somehow I mentally stayed focused on getting back to my tent, ignored the panic, and just kept walking quickly, not looking back. Whoever or whatever it was, still followed me the majority for the next hour. I just kept heading onwards, and didn't look back. A few minutes from my camp location, the fight or flight feeling gradually but succinctly left, and I crawled into my tent, and didn't sleep a minute the entire night. Morning came, I picked up my stuff, and left. This happened around three years ago, when I was away from school on a trip. The trip was for younger students. A few people from my year in school had been asked to go to help look after the younger children. To give perspectives, I was 14 when this happened. I was about 5 foot 2, female, and probably weighed less than 100 pounds. One particular day, the children were doing an orienteering activity in the woods, basically using a compass to follow a trail to find your way to the end of it. It was the third day into the trip, and by this time a group of four boys, who I now know all have severe behavioural problems, had taken a liking to me for whatever reason. Therefore, when the children got asked who they wanted their chaperone of the group to be, they chose me. 
we started the activity. And for the first 10 minutes, the group of boys seemed to be doing what they were supposed to do. And I could see other groups from my school in front and behind us. So I thought everything was going fine. The woods that we were doing this activity in were huge. I had no experience with using a compass and neither did the boys in the group. The boys I was looking after quickly became disinterested with the activity and started to run in random directions, climb trees, etc. After around 40 minutes of chasing these boys in random directions through the woods that I'd never been in before, I realized we were completely lost and expected to be at the finish line soon. I began to panic. I was only 14 and had been put in charge of younger children. Therefore, I knew I would be held responsible for getting them lost. I ended up being able to scare the boys enough, telling them the teachers would go crazy if we weren't back soon, to make them focus and help me find a proper path. As by now, we were walking through bushes and trees and completely off any type of path. This is where it gets creepy. After walking down this path for 10 minutes, I see a clearing in the trees up ahead. I couldn't see what was in this clearing. So hoping it was an exit from the woods, I started jogging up to it, followed by the boys. As I turned the corner and got a better look at the clearing, I stopped dead in my tracks. It's hard to explain how I felt when I first saw this man. All I can say is that I have never felt in so much danger before in my life. My whole body was completely glued to the spot and I could feel the color drain from my face. In the clearing, there was a man sat on a bench. He looked to be around his mid to late forties, slightly overweight and looked homeless. He was balding. However, the hair he had left looked damp, like it was greasy. His eyes looked glazed over and his mouth sort of hung open. That's when I realized on closer inspection, he had red stains all around his mouth. It's hard to describe this man, but the vibes I got were pure evil. Think Fat Trevor from GTA 5. At this point, my fight or flight instinct kicked in. I spun round to see the boys behind me, who I had completely blocked out. They all looked absolutely terrified as they had been stood behind me looking at this man too. I shouted run to the boys and sprinted past them as fast as I could. I can honestly say I've never run so fast in my life. I could hear all the boys running behind me and they were literally screaming bloody murder. I didn't even look back for a second to be completely honest. I was only thinking about myself in this moment and getting the hell out of there fast. I knew the man was chasing behind us because the boys were screaming and he's coming behind us. I don't know how the boys were shouting so much. All I could think of was my imminent death. Fortunately, my creeper was overweight and couldn't keep up with five teenagers who just got the biggest adrenaline rush of their lives. I'll never know what would have happened if we didn't run or if the man caught up with us. And I can honestly say I'm glad. We came across two elderly women walking their dogs about a half hour after the incident and managed to hitchhike a lift back to the camping grounds. I knew it was stupid but it was either sweet old ladies offering help or stay in the woods with fat cannibal Trevor. So creepy guy in the woods, let's not meet again. I've had the misfortune of coming across a few scary guys in my life. My friends will say I'm a weirdo magnet, so I'm pretty wary and clued up now that I'm a bit older. But when I was a teenager, I suppose you could say I was very naive. Back when I was 20, and my family 
my mother and little sister, had moved from a small rural village in the Shires to a town down south. It was a huge change, and as I had been having a difficult time, I welcomed the change of scenery. It was a beautiful town, in an affluent part of the country, but I struggled to find a job, and became very frustrated as my mum needed a bit of help with money. Over the course of three months, we became fairly friendly with a middle-aged guy who owned a takeaway shop in town. I will call him Phil. If ever he saw us doing some shopping, he would come and chat, and ask how the family were, and he genuinely seemed like a decent caring bloke. So when he said he might have a job for me in his shop, with a small flat upstairs that I could rent for next to nothing. I thought, okay, great. Things might be looking up. Phil got our address from my mum and said that he would pop by early evening and when he had finished, take me in the car and go to see the flat. I got myself looking fairly casual, but presentable and I'm feeling excited and confident, thinking, wow, a new job and a flat. I've killed two birds with one stone here. I just need to show him I'm sophisticated and would make a great employee. Around 8 p.m. he knocks on the front door and mum answers. He tells her we'll probably only be gone about half an hour and he'll have me back home safe and sound. Now I didn't take my phone with me as I had no credit to call out and didn't think that I would be needing it for a quick trip up the road and back. In hindsight, a pretty stupid thing to do. Maybe if I had my phone on me, it would have deterred him from doing what he was about to do. It's already dark as it's March. I get into his car and we start driving and he's chatting away and asking how I am and telling me what the flat is like when within a matter of a few minutes, I've noticed that we're not taking the conventional route that takes us directly into town. At first, I think he's taking me down some shortcut round the town to get to it quickly. And I reason with myself that he knows the area well, and I do not. 30 seconds later after that, I realize that he is taking me in the complete opposite direction. And I can tell that we are driving away from the populated town and into an area where trees swamp both sides of the road. My brain is now working overtime, thinking where the hell is this guy taking me? And I just about to manage to keep my composure and ask him outright, where are we going? Town's back the other way. I just thought it would be nice to take you on a little tour. It's beautiful here, many forests and beautiful places. I would love to show you, he tells me in his normal, cheery tone. I wasn't capable of saying anything at that moment, because the logical and the reasoning side of my brain were at full-blown war. I'm trying to keep calm, thinking, okay, he seems fairly normal. Why wouldn't he want to show me around? It is a stunning area full of natural beauty. He's probably proud to show me where he lives. The logical side, however, disagreed, and a wave of panic overcomes me, and a little voice enters my head and shouts, What's in the dark? No, you're stupid. So I just sit there in silence, taking in the scenery which is becoming more sinister by the second, because at that moment in time, I didn't know what to think. All I know is every cell in my body is screaming at me to find a way out of this situation. I started looking for a signpost, houses, any distinctive landmarks, ditches, huge trees, anything that I would be able to use to recognize my way back if I had to bolt from his car. Phil can obviously sense I'm nervous, so is just talking away at me about what the job is like and how his staff are friendly. And before I know it, he has slowed down to a crawl and has turned down a little mud road 
with a dense tree line on one side and pitch black open field on the other. My stomach literally drops and my body contemplates power vomiting all over his car because the reality of what is potentially about to happen hits me like a freight train. I'm thinking to myself, if I jump out of here, I have to be able to run over muddy fields into literally nowhere. But my imagination starts rather helpfully flashing by images of him grabbing me before I get a chance to get out of the door. So I sit there, buckled in the passenger seat, not saying a word. I just think to myself, if he attacks me, don't make a sound and don't give him the satisfaction of showing I'm scared. My brain was about as useful as a chocolate teapot. And I was starting to get angry with myself for not doing something. But I was terrified. We come out at the top of this little dirt road. And there is a tiny little car park surrounded by woodlands with one car sat in it. It's clear that the people in there were doing it as he pulls near the car. I realize that he has brought me to a local dogging spot. He turns to me, puts his hand on my knee and says, we should do what they are doing with a deadly serious expression on his face. I make this bizarre half nervous laugh, half garbled high pitch whine and try to laugh off the suggestion to show I'm not into it and super uncomfortable right now. The alarmed expression on his face at my gurgled cackle, which sounded like I've swallowed a potato, whole clearly freaks him out. And I'm mentally congratulating myself for my socially awkward and grossly unsexy reaction. It'll be fun. No one will see us. He persists. No, I don't want to. Plus, I'm kind of seeing someone right now. I lie. But he sits there just smiling at me, like a Cheshire cat, like I'm going to miraculously change my mind at the sight of his weird face. Mum will be expecting me home now, I tell him after an insanely uncomfortable 30 seconds more, as I try my hardest not to make eye contact. I'm sure she won't mind you being out a bit longer with me. You can trust me, you know. He tells me with a straight face as we sit next to the sex wagon parked next to us. I sharply pull my leg away from his grip and tell him again, mum is waiting for me and she will start panicking if I'm not home in the next few minutes. Take me home. I look him straight in the face and he knows that I'm not messing around. Okay, that's fine. I'll take you back now. Without another word, he drives me out of that creepy seedy place and back home. My finger is hovering over the seatbelt button ready to jump out. As we pull up outside our home, I breathe a sigh of relief and I can see my safety literally a few feet away. And before he can stop me, I mount and slam the door behind me. As I'm stepping over a tiny little rope fence around our garden, he gets out of his car and my heart starts to sink. I think I'll pop in and see your mum quickly, he tells me, and I swear I can see a smirk on his face, but I know he's only doing this to freak me out, knowing damn well I'm going to tell her. He was trying to delay the inevitable or scare me into keeping my mouth shut. Before I can try and talk him out of it, mum has heard us pull up and opened the front door. I barge past her with one thought on my mind. I head straight into the kitchen, grab a small knife out of the drawer and fly into my little sister's room like a madwoman. Don't you dare leave this room no matter what you hear, I say to her. Seeing the knife I've stuffed up my sleeve, she looks at me with panic in her eyes and whispers back, okay. I walk back down into the living room and the cheeky twat is on the sofa, sprawled out, comfortable as hell like he's at home. I see red, and swear to God I felt like the Hulk. I am ready for this bastard. I awkwardly perch myself on the arm of the sofa mum is sitting on, 
the absolute furthest away from him I can manage. As he just sits there, making small talk with Mum about how she is finding the area. Are the neighbours friendly? All the while, keeping his beady little weasel eyes on my every move. Why don't you come and sit over next to me? He pats on the sofa cushion next to him. No, I'm all right here, thanks. I tell him, as I'm fidgeting with my sleeve, trying to stop the little knife from falling out in front of him. Why are you sat over there? Come, come, honestly, I won't bite. He laughs and pats the seat next to him again. No, I'm quite comfortable here. Thank you very much. This time, through gritted teeth. My mum, bless her, is looking at us during this back and forth like a tennis match, and I can see something is registering in her eyes. She can see my behaviour is all off. I've got one bum cheek weirdly perched on the sofa arm, so I'm half stood up, half sat down, and I'm fiddling about with my sleeve. I'm twitchy as hell, and staring my mum in the face intensely, mentally trying to speak to her through the power of telepathy alone. I must have looked like a nutter. It's getting late now, so I think you should go, she finally speaks. Mum is starting to look anxious now, as she has finally twigged on that something has happened. Phil gets up, agrees, and mumbles something about having to check about his shop. When he walks by me and is nearly out the room, he pauses and turns to me to shake my hand. I'm thinking to myself, what a weird thing to do. I take the opportunity to kindly offer him the hand that had the knife, taking it a bit more with force than is polite to, and he soon yanked his grubby mitt out of mine when the tip of the knife blade had jabbed him. He looked down, saw the blade, and looked at me. I looked at him with such disgust. Phil hightailed it out of home as fast as he could without a word. A prick for a prick. I told my mum everything, and she was fuming. We did discuss going to the police, but there wasn't really a crime committed on his part, aside from being a major creep. Sadly, when I mentioned to a couple of girls my age who lived down our street, they clammed up and shot each other a strange look. I guess he had probably done this type of thing before. We moved away from that area after, so I'm glad I never have to see his smug face again. I am a 17 year old female. I'd like to start off by saying that most consider me an intimidating person by nature. My close friends don't really believe that, but they know that I most definitely do not mess around when it comes to certain situations, whether it's telling someone to piss off, as much as I hate to admit it, or getting physical with someone. I've never really had someone approach me in public thinking of getting the best of me, if that makes sense. About half a year ago, I was at my then house, rolling some joints with my girlfriend. I live somewhat in the middle of nowhere, and there are lots of trees in my area, and they are also in my backyard. I wouldn't classify it as a whole ass forest, but it's not small enough to simply be a grove. There's wildlife there though. My girlfriend and I hadn't smoked much that day, and we were home alone, and seeing as we could do anything we wanted, we decided to smoke these while taking a bit of a nature walk. And it seemed like an absolutely amazing idea at the time. My girlfriend sat next to me while I rolled the Harvested God's Gift in the paper. We were talking about random stuff and listening to heavy metal as I focused on rolling those sweet, sweet spliffs. I had finished rolling, and we finally decided to leave my house and walk into the plain woods, which at the time had never been intimidating to me or anyone I'd been in there with, unless they were just major cowards by nature or had anxiety. I have the joints in my pocket. We leave and we're walking through my backyard towards one of the many trails from my place. 
I should also mention it was summer. So it was only 7pm, and it wouldn't be getting dark for maybe two and a half to three hours. We light up, and for about an hour or so, it's fine. We're just talking, kissing, basic couple stuff, and we're on our second joint, just walking along the paths. Then we see this big, flat rock, like a pancake boulder. Hell yeah! We sit on it and lay down. The two of us sit like that for a while, holding hands, and passing the joint between us. Perhaps half hour after, we start hearing noises. I'd also like to mention at this point that the sun was starting to set, and perhaps there was another 30 minutes of daylight left. And that's when we started hearing the noises. We're obviously really freaked out by the sounds, and internally blamed it on the weed making us a little paranoid. There was wildlife in the forest as I'd mentioned. We were trespassing in their backyard, so why should we mind a cute bunny family making their way downtown? After a while of silence, we heard a noise that we both know damn well, and it's not an animal we heard what sounded like someone running a sharp object against a solid but jagged surface, like a rock. It was pretty far away, but somehow it was loud enough that we heard it. It was faint though. We look at each other and immediately sit up. We don't see anything. I stand up and urge her to do the same as well. This most definitely wasn't the forest fairies we had planned on seeing. We stand for a minute or so, and then we hear a big snap, like a tree branch getting stepped on with a ton of force, and then fast footsteps, like some dude sprinting. I freak out and go into panic mode, as I'm wary to admit, and of course, we were deep into the woods. I urge my girlfriend Kimber to run faster and all the way towards my house. Now my girlfriend and I aren't exactly sporty people, we're more of the academic bunch, and we weren't completely out of shape, but looking back on it, it would have been a hell of a lot easier for us had we done cross country or track or something. She runs in front of me, and I'm a little further ahead. We aren't on trail at this point, and twigs and leaves are completely shredding our faces, necks, legs and arms. We hear this person, who's obviously running after us, start a hooting and hollering like some damn inbred from the hills have eyes. That makes us soil ourselves, and we run faster. We're sprinting, huffing and puffing like fat kids during the mile or something. The person is unfortunately closer at this point, and I look back and see him. He's an older guy, about 40s give or take with long hair, and thin as hell. He's scraggy looking. This, of course, makes me defecate pure cement. I yell at my girlfriend to hurry up, and she does. I look behind me again, and he is gaining on us. She makes a turn, and I recognize it as being the one to my house. The turn was abrupt, and I thank Jesus because the guy must have been too close to process the turn. We turn off, and see the lights of my house in the almost darkness. Seeing this beacon of hope made us run even harder. This guy can't be seen, and we make it to my cleared backyard. My girlfriend runs up the back porch, and rips the sliding door open, letting me in and locking it. She slams the blinds down to cover the door, and we make sure all the doors and windows are locked. I feel my back pocket for my phone, and realise that of course, it's somewhere in those damn trees. My girlfriend's phone is dead. No house phone, because who the hell has those anymore? It was a burden at the time. My girlfriend then breaks down, having a panic or anxiety attack. I'm not sure which one. We plug in her phone, get it charging, and I turn off all the lights, except for the ones by our doors. I saw no signs of the man for the rest of the night, and for the rest of the time I'd lived there. Her phone charged and we called the cops, and they surveyed the area and found nothing. 
it was terrifying for me, and I can only imagine it's worse for my girlfriend, who suffers from anxiety. This happened in August of 2008. To preface, I was 16 and stupid. I was in love with my then boyfriend, the way that Ariel was 16 and in love with Prince Eric. His parents were split up. He lived with his dad, who was really strict and kind of scary. On the weekends, he stayed with his mum. His mum lived down the street from my aunt and best friend. At night, I would sneak over and we would hang out until the early hours of the morning. Anyway, we were caught and weren't allowed to see each other. Eventually, both of our parents got over it and conceded that we could see each other at a county fair, with his dad and stepmom supervising. At the fair, my then boyfriend Gabe told me he wanted to see me that night. He told me that he was going to walk to my house in the middle of the night. My house is probably 10 miles from his. I told him no, that he was crazy. And long story short, I decided to walk halfway to meet him. It was probably midnight, a full moon, and I'm walking along the streets. I had two cars stop and ask if I wanted a ride. I was terrified a cop was going to see me and take me home to my parents. So I said, no, thank you. I'm just going right up here to both cars because I'm 16 and 125 pounds of no muscle. I met Gabe and we walked to his house, probably because my parents were actually awake at my house and his mum would be asleep. I tell him about the scary cars that stopped and asked if I needed a ride. He asks why I didn't take one of them up on their offer. No one asked him if he needed a ride. He would have taken one. It would have been faster to meet me that way. We get to his house, make out, hang out, and I eventually decide I need to leave before my parents wake up and notice I'm gone. I try to go to my aunt's, but no one's home, so I start walking. It's summer and about 5am, so it's light out, and I decide to take a different road back home. I'm walking along this long stretch of road that I've been on many times when I take the bus to school. I'm listening to my iPod and see a pretty old cell phone on the ground. I pick it up and I'm surprised because it turns on, and it works. A couple of cars have passed me, and I'm starting to get a little anxious on how long it's going to take me to get home before my parents wake up. I think about what Gabe said, about how if someone had offered him a ride, he would have taken it. I decided that if someone stops and offers me a ride, I will take it. I really didn't want to be caught and grounded again, I'm not actively trying to hitchhike, putting my thumb out for a ride though. I'm carrying the phone and wondered if it had service, when an old beat up car slows down next to me. I turn my head slightly as I'm walking and an older man starts talking to me. Do you want a ride? He asks. I finally stop and take a closer look. He looks unkept hair starting to fall out, is unshaven and a bit on the heavy side. My stranger danger sense is tingling, but I told myself I need to stop being such a wuss. I needed to get home and I'll just tell creepy car dude to drop me off at the casino. That is only about three miles away. I think that I'll at least shave some time off my trek. I get in the creepy guy's car, and he starts driving. He asks me what my name is, how old I am. I give him my very common middle name, and tell him I'm 18. I remember debating telling him my real age, thinking maybe it would make him think twice about doing anything funny with a minor. All of a sudden, creepy care dude puts his hands on my knee 
and tells me how beautiful I am. I'm frozen. I don't know how I'm supposed to react. I'm uncomfortable and alarms are going off in my head. Thank you, I say. He starts to move his hand a little more and we pass the casino. I tell him that the casino is fine, really, and that he doesn't have to keep driving me. He tells me he's going to a specific road closer to my actual destination, and he doesn't mind helping me out. I think of anything to distract this guy and to get his nasty hand off me. I pull out the cell phone I found earlier and start talking animatedly. Look what I found when I was walking. I found it right before you pulled over. It still looks like it even works. I wonder who it belonged to. I'm saying anything to keep myself from panicking and giving away the fact that I'm scared. It works. The creepy dude's eyes got bigger. It looks like he struck gold. He takes his hand off me to grab the phone. Oh, I'll hold on to that for you. I'll make sure it gets back to the owner. I nod enthusiastically, agree that's what's best, and he keeps the cell phone in his hand, checking it out. He drives past his initial road, saying he can take me even closer to my place. I thank him profusely, and act more bubbly, and start talking about random nonsense. In reality, I'm still afraid of him knowing which road I live on. He finally gets to my driveway, which is about 200 feet or a little longer, with several different driveways that you can pull into. You can't see my house from the end of it though. He pulls over on the road and says, I'll just drop you off here. I think it's probably best that your parents don't see me dropping you off. Wouldn't want them to think anything, he winks. I smile and nod and thank him. He mentions something about seeing each other around, still smiling and nodding. I start walking up to my driveway and I wait until he drives off to run up to my house. I'm amazed and so, so grateful that nothing happens to me. I really don't know what would have happened if I didn't find that cell phone to distract him with because I don't want to find out. I don't make stupid decisions like that anymore. I think I used all my lifetime luck to get out of that seemingly unharmed, and I hope to not meet again. Last summer, a good friend and I embarked on a backpacking trip through the White Mountain National Forest in New Hampshire. As fairly experienced day hikers, we felt comfortable in the whites for our inaugural overnight trip. While planning, my buddy Ellis figured we could hike back to a country campsite to make our first wilderness night a little more fun. I wasn't going to disagree. Beautiful views, historic trails, and a protected night in the dry river wilderness. I was stoked to say the least. Before any hiking trip I do, I always conduct a little internet research on the trails or shelters that I will be coming across. Throughout the mid to late 1900s, there were a series of these lean-tos up and down the dry river wilderness meant for backpackers or through hikers, really looking to escape the crowd in more popular areas of forest. Though as time went on and the forest service had other more pressing matters, Many of these shelters were dismantled, except Dry River Shelter Number 3, the last remaining shelter in this wilderness zone. On the morning of our hike, I met Ellis at the trailhead, and we set off. The sky was overcast, bringing it with a dense fog throughout the forest. The weather left us with nearly no visibility. So, there went our stunning views. At least the trail consisted of prime, technical New England rock scrambling alongside the Amunusuk River. Ellis and I made it up to the Presidential Ridge, stopping by the Lakes of the Clouds. 
The hut was filled with day hikers, backpackers, and through hikers all socializing together. We were even rewarded with some sun and a brief glimpse of the dry river valley on the summit of Mount Monroe before the fog rolled back in. With dwindling views and a stiff wind, Ellis and I hustled tree line down to the dry river shelter number three, our home for the night. Once we dropped off the ridge into the valley, we entered the wilderness zone where rangers patrolled sparringly. Time to really be alone in the wild. As we trekked into the wilderness, all signs of civilization disappeared and the trail was densely overgrown. Although it had been raining all week, there were no footprints in the mud either. At least we would be having some relaxing isolation, I figured. After about an hour or so of descending, Ellis spotted the lean-to just as our legs were asking for relief. A gorgeous old timber structure with a well-used fire pit along a cold mountain river. Pristine camping. As we settled in and explored the site, I found a small boundary notebook nestled in the corner of the structure. On the cover, someone wrote, Dry River Shelter Number 3. Out of curiosity, I opened it, but found nothing more than a lone man's name scribbled onto the first page in a date. Just your standard camping log. Oddly though, the man signed the book the previous day. We saw no footprints or signs of human or even animal disturbance on the trails or here at the shelter. Rain can wash away tracks, but not all signs of animal life. Something felt off to me. I showed it to Ellis who found it curious, but thought nothing more of the single name. He convinced me the man was probably a hiking veteran and a professional at LNT. I bought into Ellis's thoughts on the situation in order to ease my mind. As the sun set, we started a roaring fire alongside the riverbank. Ellis commented how quiet the location was, having not seen another soul beyond the chirps of birds since leaving the Crawford path. The silence was eerie, but we figured that city life desensitized us to the wild. The sun was setting and we grew tired with the darkness. Ellis took the lean-to, and I spent the night in my tent. Sleep came quickly after hiking eight plus miles with 20 pounds on my back, but this didn't last long. A brutally sharp slapping noise woke me up. The only thing I could compare the noise to were to be someone swinging a two by four onto a tree or snapping a thick branch. I figured it was a bear searching for our food bag hanging in a tree some 20 to 50 yards away. Nothing out of the ordinary for New Hampshire. Sleep overtook me once again, and I remember waking up to the sun rising over the peaks. I stumbled out of my tent to see Ellis also waking up slowly. As we made our morning oats and coffee, I wandered around the site again to see if I could find the marks the bear left. Instead, I noticed something odd. The small notebook was open. I swear that I put that thing back where I found it, which involved closing it and putting it in the back corner of the shelter. I most certainly didn't leave it open on the floor. Hey, Ellis, were you checking out this camp log last night? Nah, I passed out, man. It's not like there's anything to read anyway. You sure? I commented as I bent over to pick it up. The lone hiker's name was not so lonely anymore. At least 20 more names filled the pages. The lone traveler whose name was originally on the first page could now be found several pages deep into the notebook. I tossed it to Ellis, whose face instantly dropped the second his mind registered what was on the page. Great. Now I knew it wasn't just some dehydration delusion of the previous day. Dude, we must have been seeing things last night. There's no way we could have missed all these names. How the hell could we? Ellis said. This is when I began to tell Ellis about the slapping noise during the night. I received nothing other than instant denial. 
These sounds were not the result of some hooligans or backward crazies harassing us. Ellis was convinced. Rather sternly, he commented, It's a bear, Jack. It's a bear. Now let it go. And, well, we did. Ellis led us out onto the site and on our way home not ten minutes later. A year has passed, and I'm still not quite sure what happened during our night at the Dry River Shelter 3. The memory of seeing a single name written on the front page of the notebook is so crisp in my mind. I couldn't have mistaken it. Could I have mistaken the noises I heard, and the new additions to the book? Ellis feels the same way about the whole scenario. What do you think? Or were we not welcomed by the New Hampshire wilderness? Years ago, when I was still a teenager, my friend Justin and I would often go longboarding at night, as my friend and I were quite the night owls. We loved the freedom of almost never seeing another soul on the roads or the paths we frequented. Even when using main roads, it would be very rare to see a car out so late in such a rural area, and you could see and hear them coming from very far away due to their headlights and the noise of the vehicle disrupting the peaceful silence of the night. We were really into it at the time, and would often ride our boards for miles and miles, sometimes not arriving home until the sun was up. One particular night, we decided to ride a few miles away from our usual back roads, to take one of our favourite hidden routes. It began with a narrow paved path, that was the only piece of land separating two sides of a long lake. It would often sink under due to rain, and we wanted to seize the opportunity to use it before it rained and went underwater again. It was roughly two miles long, and extremely relaxing to ride through due to the scenery. After making it to the end of the lake, we decided to continue moving, and turn into a very close path that leads directly into a densely wooded wilderness preservation. As we came up to the first hill, we looked down at the bottom into the blackness. We both noticed what appeared to be a tiny moving ball of dim light down there. It moved so strangely, and it was extremely difficult to make out what it was. Rather than shine our flashlight down, we curiously watched it for a few moments, whispering to each other about what it could possibly be. All at once, that small light turned into multiple blinding lights, and extremely loud, revving sounds, overwhelming our senses that had become accustomed to the dark and silence. Acting purely on fear, we instantly turned around and ran as fast as we could hearing yelling and revving gaining behind us. By sheer luck, we managed to run off the path into a very dark, very overgrown hole in the side of a hill, overlooking where we had just come from. We decided to hide in the natural dugout of this hill, hoping the plants and darkness would be enough to protect us from whatever was happening out there. We watched our pursuers ride up to where we had originally been standing. There were four men, two on four-wheelers, and two on fully-sized motorcycles. They were yelling at each other about something, but we couldn't make out what they were saying due to the distance we had covered. We felt safe enough to whisper very softly to each other, and speculate who these people could be. Our first thought was they might be park rangers of some kind. Although we had never seen one here in the many times we'd been through, and honestly we doubted that this county had the budget or even the desire to have anyone patrol the deep woods at night. Besides that, these men were on vehicles entirely inappropriate for the paved bike trails, and they were very angry about something. They called out to us for a while, yelling things like, We know you're out there. We can see you. 
come out. We stayed silent and decided to call their bluff instead of running. Eventually, we clearly heard one of the men yell, find them now and smash a bottle. That had erased any hopes we had that these were just park rangers. We watched them split up, each of them going a different way down the series of paths on their vehicles, including the path we came from. It took us what felt like ages to even move. We were frozen in terror inside that dugout, watching the lights from the vehicles travel through the woods and paths. One of them already coming full circle and passing the point he started from. I thought about calling for help, but was too afraid to open my phone in fear that even the smallest amount of light would give away our location. After waiting for the lights of the vehicles to reach their furthest distance yet, we finally summoned the nerve to get up and try to run somewhere far enough from these people to safely make a call. We ran as hard and fast as we could through the woods. Since their headlights gave away their location on these paths, we could hide again whenever we felt that they were getting too close. Our available hiding spots were getting progressively worse as the woods became less dense, and the fear I felt waiting for one of them to drive past us while basically only being covered in leaves and plants may still be unmatched to this day. Finally, we emerged from the woods onto the intersection of two main roads, far from where we had started. We ducked down into the ditch to call for help. When I opened my phone, I noticed I had recent missed calls from one of our other friends, Connor, who was supposed to meet up with us after our longboard excursion. I called him and frantically asked where he was. Luck was with us again. He hadn't given up on our plans despite us ignoring him, and was only a few miles away, already heading in our direction. I gave him the names of the two streets we were near the corner of, and explained that we needed to be picked up right away. He agreed, and sped over to us while Justin and I waited in hiding. Thankfully, Connor arrived before any of those men did. We bolted into the back seats of his car, yelling for him to get the hell out of there, and he took off. Relief doesn't begin to describe what I felt being safely driven home after everything I had experienced. After explaining everything that happened to Connor, we ended up just moving on with our night and decided not to call the police. We figured they would be gone by the time any officer made it out there, and that we would only be putting ourselves at risk by admitting to breaking the law and taking those paths so late at night. I still have no idea what happened or who those people were. I've been told all kinds of theories from friends and family that have heard this story. Some think we walked right up to a huge drug deal. Justin and I later admitted to each other that when the revving started and we couldn't see it, our minds both went straight to chainsaw wielding horror movie serial killer. So I suppose it could have been much worse. Frustratingly enough, whatever those men thought we saw that made them want to catch us so badly, we never actually saw. We'll never really know, I suppose. I've had a lot of strange jobs, but one of the most interesting was working for a tax company based out of Texas. I lived in Kentucky, my home state at the time, but because this company contracted out jobs remotely, I was able to make a very good living for performing tasks which were generally very simple. I had a work partner, and our duty was to travel all over the eastern and central part of the state to county courthouse PVA offices. You might not have those, it's a small town thing, and research delinquent property taxes. We were then required to compile a list of properties who had delinquent taxes and submit it to our boss. She was our primary contact in Texas. This part is important because it was the only reason we would sometimes have to deal with hostile people. 
The company would then buy the taxes if the property tickled their fancy. And a letter was issued to the owner of the property, stating they had a certain amount of time to repay the amount. I'm not sure what would happen after that, since that isn't part of my job. But I do know that people immediately assumed, because of lack or knowledge or understanding of the law, this company was going to take their property and throw them out on the street. Before the company bought the taxes, however, they would send us back a list of the ones they were interested in. And we would then go out to the location, photograph the property, and then submit all the photos to our Texas contact. This is where things got interesting. It was like the property owners had some kind of psychic intuition about us. They had no idea who we were, or when we were coming since we worked almost always on our own. And they didn't know what kind of color car we would be in. Yet somehow they would frequently burst out their front doors as we pulled up to take pictures of their location. This made for some interesting and often frightening confrontations. After getting comfortable with the job, I even came up with a convincing story to tell angry property owners when they chased us down with their car. We're from the Country Property Valuation Administration. We're just updating our property files and need a current photo. This would de-escalate the situation and they'd apologize for threatening our lives and sometimes running us off the road to make us pull over. I had a lot of stories from this job, but here's the best one. We were deep in the hills of Eastern Kentucky one day, searching desperately for a single wide trailer from our list. We found a holler matching our direction. This is way before the GPS days, and we had to use real country maps and took a chance. As we drove up the holler, houses began to spread out further and further, and soon we were totally isolated, nothing but trees and a narrow gravel road. Suddenly, we spotted the trailer. It didn't look anything like it did in the PVA picture. Time had really taken a toll on this place. Some of you might not understand this, depending on where you're from, but around my home state, one grows very accustomed to the look and feel of a potential location for drug manufacturing. I know that might not make sense, but trust me, we knew immediately that this place was a prime location for a meth lab. We didn't spot the trailer until we had driven a little ways past it, so we didn't get a great photo on the way in. As usual, we decided to drive on by, turn around, and get the shot on the way back. Apparently, someone saw us on the way in. This was a very rural road, and not even a road at this point since it had turned to gravel a mile or two back. I basically had to turn the car by pulling up onto an embankment and doing what felt like a 32 point turn to keep from going off into a ditch. While I was turning, my buddy said, Hey, look. I looked and three people were walking out of the woods into the road. Just people, no big deal. I had the car straightened out on the road at this point, and noticed they had weapons. A young nasty looking fellow was holding a baseball bat of all things. A nasty looking older fellow had a shovel. Both were shirtless. And then there was a screaming girl. Something clicked in my head. On the drive in when my partner snapped the photo, I heard a girl scream. It was an angry scream, but I couldn't make out what she said. I didn't even know where it came from, and I certainly didn't think the scream was directed at us. Apparently it was. These people were now walking with intention towards my car. I kept thinking, is this really happening? And what exactly is happening? My partner was freaking out a little, and convinced they were going to attack us. It's hard to explain what was going on through my head at this point because I couldn't really believe what I was seeing. The only thing I could think of was, hit him with the car, just like on Grand Theft Auto, otherwise you're gonna die. They were screaming, shaking their weapons and closing in, and I was running out of time. 
I revved the tiny engine in my red Pontiac Grand Prix, hoping to scare them, and then I let off the gas. I plowed towards them with the fury of all six cylinders, or four, however many there were, and they jumped out of the way at the last minute, as I grazed by them, throwing gravel and dirt into the air. Once we were at a safe distance, I slowed down and looked back. Luckily, they were gone. Unluckily, we were once again too far from the trailer to get a good shot. I explained this to my boss when I emailed her my day's recollection of property photos, and she seemed to understand. After that, I kept a loaded 0.45 in my glove box and felt significantly more confident while doing my job. I quit a couple of years later though. It was just too dangerous, even if I was packing heat. So to the hillbilly meth-making counterparts of Otis, Baby, and Captain Spaulding, let's not meet again. Let me set up stage. At the time, I was living in Traverse City, Michigan. Beautiful landscape for those wondering. Huge glacier-carved hills, and Lake Michigan at your back. I rented a little townhouse with a longtime friend, a little ways outside the city. I had just gotten a hold of my old bicycle, which I had shipped up from my old hometown, and I was raring to start riding around. And that's how this all got started. It was my day off, and I decided to save gas and ride my bike into town. I geared up, checked my tires, and roared off. I had been big on riding my bike once upon a time, and it came back like, well, riding a bike. What I didn't notice, however, was how quickly I was moving. If I had been paying attention, I would have realized the constant downward slope I was on, and how biking back up would most likely pose a difficulty for my winter lapsed muscles. But none of that mattered at the time. I made it into town, did some shopping, met up with my roommate for dinner, and generally had a good time till I noticed the sun was setting. I bid my adieus, hopped on my bike, and pedalled off into the sunset. At first I did alright, but that aforementioned incline wore me down. By the time I reached the last leg of my journey, it was pitch black, and I was walking my bike. At which point, the road faced me with a choice. To my left was the regular road, which was lit better, but also a longer trek to get to the townhouse row I occupied. To my right was a more direct route to and from town. I drove it every day, and in fact, had used it to come into town that very same day. It was heavily wooded and unlit, but featuring a shorter route, albeit with a steeper hill. I figured since I was already walking, I might as well just take the shorter, familiar path. So I turned on my bike's headlamp and headed into the even greater darkness of the road through the woods. It all went well for a bit. I trudged along and cursed myself for being so stupid and overconfident with my bike. Then I heard it. Footsteps off to my right side in the woodlands. I stood still and they stopped abruptly. There in the blackness, I debated what it might be. But as a veteran of the woods, I hoped it was just local wildlife and continued on. The footsteps started up again. They stopped when I stopped, just a hint later. I started and stopped once more, to be sure that I wasn't hearing things. This last time, the steps continued for a solid ten seconds after I had stopped, making me sure something, or someone, was out there. I still do not know what, though I logically leaned towards human, as the gait sounded bipedal and more precise than a quadruped. With this in mind, I weighed my options. If I dropped the bike and ran towards home, it would be far too easy to catch me. The same was even true if I ran back towards town. I was not in any way prepared for a chase, and I didn't want to initiate one. 
my mind strayed to the utility knife that I always carry in my purse, but I shoved that thought aside. I have enough martial arts training to know the knife was a bad idea, and I was more comfortable taking whoever or whatever was out barehanded, rather than escalating things with a blade. Instead, I called my roommate who was still in town, gave her my location, and told her what was happening. She told me she'd be there in 10 minutes. I hung up and started walking again. The footsteps started up too, this time faster and clearly out of sync with my own. And that's when I got mad. I have a weird thing where fear makes me angry and hostile. And being followed through the woods had officially punched my buttons from terrified to murderous. So I turned to the woods and roared with a voice I didn't know I had. How about you come out and face me, you piece of crap? I'll rip your stomach open and wear your intestines for a necklace. For the life of me, I don't know where I got the guts or the words for that. It might as well have been a bad move, but the woods were rather abruptly quiet and nothing came at me. I stayed still, staring hard, ready to beat the ever-loving crap out of anything that moved but nothing did. Then my roomie came on scene, her headlights almost blinding me as she turned the curve to where I was. I tossed my bike into her car, and we hauled ass somewhere. I collapsed once I got home, vomited from pure nerves, and finally crashed at 3am. And that's my story. Was it a person? An animal? I feel compelled to lead towards the former if for no better reason than because it sounded like a person walking, then what animal would just be so precise in following and winding me up? But who knows? Maybe I scared the crap out of some poor porcupine. Regardless, I'd rather not encounter it again. This happened last year in Virginia, and is also the reason why I never backpack alone anymore. I was taking summer courses at the time, and we ended up with a three-day weekend in June, so I thought it would be a great time to go and explore some of the Virginian wilderness. I did a Google search and found a state park with a trail that looked nice, and let my roommate and family know the trail that I was going to be going on. When I got close to the park area, I saw a little outdoor shop where people hiking the Appalachian Trail stop. I went in to grab a map of the area in case I got lost. As I was talking to the owner, he mentioned a trail that's not well known that has a pretty cool waterfall and swimming hole. This piqued my interest, so I had him show me on the map. It took me outside the state park, but he said it was a great place to go. I paid for the map and thanked the owner. I texted my roommate and parents about the new trail, and I parked my car and set off on my adventure. I should note that the waterfall was going to be a side trip from my journey. I was planning three days, two nights. I started on part of the Appalachian Trail, and it was pretty packed with people, and some of them were really fun to talk to. As expected, as I got further and further from the main trails, I saw less and less people. Around early afternoon, three miles from my destination, I noticed it was unnaturally silent. No birds, no bugs, not even wind, and I had a feeling of being watched. I shook it off as me overanalyzing the situation. I got to the waterfall, and it wasn't too spectacular, but it was cool to look at. Plus, it had a good size area to swim in. So naturally, I stripped down to my skivvies and took a dip. It was pretty refreshing. As I was getting my clothes back on, I started whistling to myself. It was Chill Bill because it was stuck in my head. And that's when I heard something whistling the same tune back. I thought it was a bird copying me. So I went back and forth with it, and it repeated everything I whistled. I thought it was pretty neat. As I was setting up camp, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched again, 
and I would get goosebumps and my hairs would stand on end. As night fell, I built a small fire and lit my jet boil to make dinner as I did this, because I became hyper aware that again, there was no sound, just deafening silence. Some part of my brain was telling me that I'm not safe to leave. And I ignored it and crawled into my tent with my flashlight and book. I went to sleep without incident. When I awoke the next morning, my sight was trashed. My camp stool was nowhere to be found. My bear bag with my food was cut down and the contents were thrown around the site. My first thought was a crafty animal chewed through the rope and got to the bag. But when I looked at the rope, it was cut with something very sharp and none of the food was touched. I also noticed bare footprints all around my campsite. And keep in mind, I'm at least six to eight miles from a road. As I was looking at the mess, I heard a branch snap off in the distance. I turned to look in that direction. And I saw nothing. But I heard that whistling again. My whistle from yesterday. But it was different, more sinister and made my hair stand on end. And that's when I listened to my instincts to get the hell out of there. It sounded like it was a little off in the distance. So I packed up my camp as quickly as I could. The whistling getting ever closer as I finished stuffing the tent into my bag. I didn't bother putting anything away properly. The whistling was incessant and sounded like it was coming from all directions. I got fed up with the whistling, stood up and yelled into the woods. Shut up. What do you want? It stopped. It was quiet for a moment. And then it repeated what I said in my voice. It sounded just like me, it distorted like it came from an old TV. After I heard this, I immediately threw my pack on and ran in the direction I came. I heard it moving just behind me, fast switching between the whistle and my voice. It felt like it was toying with me, not coming too close, but not being too far. Eventually, it sounded like it got further and further away from me. And then it stopped all of a sudden. When it stopped, I stopped and turned around. And I wished I hadn't. Because I heard the most bone chilling screeching ever coming from right next to me. That's when I started running again. I didn't look, I only ran. Less than a half mile I ran into a couple that were also backpacking. They saw the look of terror in my face and asked me if it were me that screamed and if I was okay. I told them what happened. And they decided to not go down where I had just come from. We moved to a more populated trail as quickly as we could. And as soon as I got back into my car, I drove to one of the park ranger stations and reported what happened. Since the site was off park grounds, they told me it wasn't in their jurisdiction, but that they will send a ranger to investigate. The ranger station parking lot run right up to the woods where I was getting into my Jeep. And I heard the chill bill tune coming from the woods just in front of me. I never drove so fast in my life. When I told my roommate, why I was only there for one night. All he said to me in reply was, Bro, I'm never going camping with you. I found some cheap train tickets to Luxembourg. And being the adventurous person I am, decided to book last minute and go all by myself. Due to some unfortunate and lack of planning circumstances, I ended up on that train to Luxembourg with nothing to wear for the weekend except the clothes on my back. I figured it was no big deal. How boring would it have been for everything to have gone according to plan? Anyway, Luxembourg City is quite small. And after two days, I had pretty much seen most of what I wanted to see. A quick Google search showed me that there was a beautiful forest some kilometers north of the city. I thought it looked perfect. So I bought a day train pass and set out on my journey. I managed to make it there. And it was gorgeous. I wasn't really dressed for hiking since I had no clothes or shoes with me at the time. 
but didn't want to miss out on such an amazing experience. So I ventured into the forest anyway. I was wearing shorts and a t-shirt, and ballet flats for shoes. I told myself I'd stay close to the area, and not do any crazy rock climbing or anything, and nothing would go wrong. Boy, was that a dumb assumption to make. I was about 45 minutes away from where I started walking. There was no one else around, and I walk along a sharp turn, and there's a lady walking towards me. She was probably 45 or so, and seemed quite plain. As we approached each other, she suddenly says, That's not okay. I ignore this, as I try to ignore people on the street as much as possible, and continue walking. She has reached the point of being right next to me now, and as she passes, she says, You can't do this. There's no one else around. So she has to be talking to me. I reluctantly turn towards her and ask, Pardon me? She says, How dare you show up here like this? I think she has me confused for someone else. I offer her an apology and continue, but she follows. Don't you understand? You're ruining it. I say nothing. What the hell am I supposed to say? I see some big branches close by that I could perhaps use as a weapon if I need to. I don't even know what's going on at this point. She's screaming now, repeating it's all sacred, and my shoes are ruining the sacredness of the forest. I stand my ground, offer one more apology, and she tells me I'm going to regret it. I don't know why, but I told her that I had nothing else to wear, trying to justify myself, I suppose. Then she tells me it doesn't matter. I'm starting to feel relieved. Maybe she'll leave me alone. The forest is protected. Do you know who protects it? She says. No. Realistically, where can I run? Nowhere. Who can I call? No one. So I have to face this lady at all times. I don't want her attacking me from behind or something. She proceeds to tell me that Jesus Christ is protecting the forest. I nod. Sounds about right. She repeats that it doesn't matter to her anymore that I'm wearing ballet flats. She then says that Jesus and God know, since she told them. She tells me that God will not let me leave the forest. Pardon? And she tells me slowly that God knows I have forsaken the forest and that I am a traitor and a sinner. She tells me that I'm not going to make it out and that I will never leave. God will never let me, that he sees me here, ruining the sacredness of the forest, and he sent her to find me, that I had my chance, and that he will dish out the punishment that I deserve. I nod. I'm kind of scared, but at least she has left it up to God to punish me, so I should be safe. I just need her to walk away. We hold eye contact for a long 45 seconds, and then she turns and carries on. I stay where I am, slowly back up into a tree, and wait while I watch her leave. I was afraid she had some nearby friends, so I wanted my back up against something to make me feel safer. She was still within earshot when I heard her say, He won't let you leave. You know nothing you can do can change that. She kept walking and never turned back. I waited 15 minutes with my back to that tree, then slowly kept going and never saw her again. Religious fanatic in the Mullethal Forest, let's not meet again. My dad spent 10 years logging in old growth forests in the Pacific Northwest. His own personal scary experiences amount to leaning up against a tree taking a break when a mountain lion staunted into view. My dad waves his hand and says, Hey cat, and it froze and tore off into the bushes. But 
A logger friend was driving home through the logging roads one night, late with his buddy, when all of a sudden a light enveloped them and shook their whole truck. They pulled off to the side of the road as far as they could and waited, scared to death. But it was gone, and they never saw it again. Another logging friend was finishing with another guy deep in the forest by a river, after a fresh rain. There are kinds of little sandbanks in the river, where stands of small trees and grass grow up on them. They waded into the river and onto the sandbanks when the rain started up again. Just then, the first guy stopped in his tracks and started, called his friend over, and there was a fresh giant footprint in the sand larger than any of their size 14 or so feet, at least twice over, being erased as they looked at it in the rain. It had to have been made in the 15 minutes or so between the rain showers. My dad was engaged for a while to an Indian woman. She remembers being a little girl and her grandmother showing up where X, wherever the native word for Sasquatch is, has gone up into the hillside. Something had torn it way up into the hill, tearing young trees and plants aside viciously. The wreckage was huge. My stepsister's uncle was a hunter, like so many others in the state. He gave me my first guitar, and is sadly passed away now. He chose a time when we were camping, and my back was to the forest, to tell us about the one time when he was hunting. He came back to a tree break where a natural meadow was formed in the mountains. He decided to crouch on the edge for a moment and use his binoculars to scan the far tree line. Just then, a foul stench hit him in the face. He lowered the binoculars and shook his head to clear the smell. Then out of the middle of the meadow, a shape began to take focus as it stood up on two legs. There, he thought. He raised up the binoculars to see the back side of something very, very large, making its way quickly out of the meadow on two legs, stinking up the whole place. I shudder to still think of that. My mum grew up, way out in the Olympic National Forest, with four younger sisters. One night, they were driving home through the woods, where their engine began sputtering and dying. My mum, who was driving got it going again, and they stopped at a gas station to call her parents, to tell them that they were having some car troubles. They all got out of the gas station, and were astonished when the car turned on behind them, with no one in it. I have no idea why they got back in after that, but I'm guessing their house wasn't too far away. My mum looked in the rearview mirror, and saw what she described as a football-shaped object, all lit around the borders by bright lights, following them at treetop level. All four of her sisters saw it too. When they finally turned on their road, it was lost to sight amongst the trees. On top of all of that, they heard from around the town that other people's engines were having problems that same night. My mum and my aunts are the least imaginative people I know. There is no one less likely to see things or make up stories. Another time when my mum was a teenager, she had two roommates, and their local church asked them if a woman had come to town could stay the night with them, and they agreed. In the middle of the night, they heard a strange low mumbling coming from the bathroom. The way my mum remembers it, they peeked into the bathroom, and the woman was inside chanting and a demonic face was peering back from the mirror. They booked it into the bedroom, and were so scared they opened the windows and piled out over to a neighbor's. Again, not the kind of people who make these things up. My cousin and I were sitting in a hot tub, gazing up at the night sky, when all of a sudden, a bright green arc spread across the sky. Off center was a giant green blob we were frozen in fear, staring. I was ready to bolt inside the house, but my cousin wanted to stay out to see what it was. Then it blinked at us, 
and moved in a zigzag pattern. That was enough for me, and I leapt out and ran into the house, babbling to my aunts about the sky and the lights. My one aunt said, Oh, she reads too much. Thanks, Aunt Linda. But my cousin, who saw it with me, has an impeccable record and backed me up. Apparently, though, many strange things have been seen in the sky, in East Wenatachi. The last thing that happened to me was in Wenatachi too. Years later at my aunt's house, which is right next to a cemetery on one side, a really big apple orchard on the second, hills on the third, and the subdivision on the last. It was winter and the orchard was filled with snow. My cousins and I went out into the snow under the moon to play hide and seek in the orchard. About 15 of us charged out there, deep into the orchard, and who gets the frickin' short straw to seek first but me? So I waited and counted about two minutes and then set off. It was really spooky, but I was excited. All the trees looked so dark and knobbly. The light of the moon was nearly gone under the branches. Instead of zigzagging around, I went straight through and found myself on the far side of the orchard, almost in the open. I turned back when I heard a voice say, Over here. I laughed and said, Nikki? There was only an old building there, no house, and really nothing to see, so I was confused. The voice was high and clear like a young girl's, and said over and over, Come here, closer, closer. I took a few hesitant steps towards it, then fear washed over me and I just bolted back into the orchard calling for my cousins. Everyone came out all concerned, and they must have seen how scared I was, because everyone got scared, and we all fled back to my aunt's house, where I again was branded the one who reads. In the daylight, I went back, thinking there must have been a house or windows that I was hearing, maybe a TV or something. Nope, just a building, not a scary one. But there was nothing there, and nowhere I could have been hearing the voice in front of me coaxing me closer. About eight years ago, we went to a friend's condo in the city. They were a bit of an odd couple, but very nice and brilliant. The guy wanted us to borrow this book on spiritual nature, and said that it was really good. I don't like things like that, so I flipped through the book and something fell off. So I told my husband I didn't really want to take it. We said thanks, but no thanks, and left without it. About three months later, we needed to use our spare tire, and lifted up the floorboards covering it in the trunk section of our SUV. There was the book. Oh, hell no. I've heard and never believed of the stories of books that wouldn't be gotten rid of, so we threw it in the trash and I was really ready to burn the crap out of it if it popped up again. Thankfully, it seemed to stay there. My husband was really freaked out and pissed about that. It was easily the most unexplainable thing that's happened to me personally. Most of this all happened a long time ago, so I've forgotten the finer details, but it all adds to the argument that there are unexplained things in this world. Corbett National Park in India. We had just spent four rainy, disappointing days in the company of mud-spattered jeeps, spotted deer, noisy wild chickens, and bland ramen. Tomorrow would be our last day. It was a full moon night. My friend and I were chilling at the edge of our camp, located just above a broad, rocky riverbed. We had to leave early the next morning, so the rest of our party had gone to bed, or were doing shots and playing cards in the tent. The couple was still hanging out by the embers of the dying campfire. My friend and I thought it best to head down to the riverbed to smoke our cigarettes. Things were peaceful, and we made our way through half a pack. I was busy reclining on a rock and contemplating the stars, when I suddenly felt my friend grasp my sleeve. I raised my head. He didn't need to point. I could see it too. 
It wasn't far away. In fact, it was close. A tiger. A fully grown tiger. Separated from us by a bed of pebbles, a few rocks and a shallow two foot stream. Not more than 10 meters away. Except it was completely blue. And it was standing up on its hind legs, front paws lifted in an embrace of something invisible. I still remember the gleam in its eyes, one orange, one green. It was looking right at us. It was also frozen absolutely still as a statue. Not a roar, not a purr, nothing. Like one of those dioramas of the saber toothed tiger you find in museums. One of our guides had warned us about a blue tiger that prowled around on full moon nights, looking for lost people to eat. We had welcomed the story as one of those fun touristy things when it was first told to us, but not to be taken seriously. But there it was, right in front of us. Fear did not take a hold of me yet. I did go lightheaded within seconds though, and started to think of my family and wondering what they would be doing right now. My friend's presence was oddly reassuring because I kept thinking fiercely over and over in my head. I'm not lost. I'm not lost. It knows I'm not lost. It can't eat me. Look, I'm not alone. I realized I was pleading with the universe. Somewhere far, far away, I heard my friend say very, very calmly, pick up the stumps. Don't leave them there. I vaguely remember obeying him. And then when I turned away from the frozen tiger, took it out of my vision, both direct and peripheral, the fear washed over me like a tidal wave. Goosebumps erupted across my shoulders and back, and I screamed. My friend and I ran like we had never run, yelling, leaping and bounding over rocks and scrambling up the embankment like cartoons. I was so sure that at any moment, the tiger would pounce on me. I vividly remember my heart pounding in my ear and thinking of the raptors in the tall grass in Jurassic Park too. We did not stop running until we had raced past the now fizzled campfire and reached the reception area, where there were still a few people up and about. Needless to say, when we went back to take a look 15 minutes later from the embankment, as there was no way in hell we were going down to the riverbed again, with flashlights and 10 other campers that we had managed to rouse, the tiger was gone. We told the others our story all next morning. It wasn't like they didn't believe us. They believed we saw something, just not a blue tiger. They thought it was the moonlight playing tricks on us, while others thought that we were high. On top of that, the guide who had warned us about the tiger was behaving very shifty and smug all morning, as if he knew what was going on. A couple of people joked that maybe he had thrown on a costume and we'd fallen for it. Ugh, it wasn't like that. There was something unnatural, something unearthly about what we had seen on the riverbed. I knew it. My friend knew it. And between the two of us, we knew that we would be the only ones who knew what we had seen. That experience changed the way I viewed a lot of things. I am no longer skeptical about religion and the paranormal. I do believe there are things in this world we maybe never are going to be able to understand or comprehend. It is a peaceful place to be in, but my most immediate takeaway and my biggest piece of advice to you don't mess around in the wilderness. Respect the rules, but you have no idea what is waiting for you there. A few months back, my girlfriend and I were bored hanging out around the house and spontaneously decided to go out for a hike. We don't go hiking often, but the idea appealed to the both of us. And even though there was only about an hour left of light. We figured we had enough time to go and enjoy a hike before it got too dark. We quickly filled up our water bottles and put on the best walking shoes we had 
and were out of the door driving up into the mountains. Around my area, there are many hiking trails, with the variety of trails increasing as you go up the mountain. We tended to stay around the base of the mountain in the occasional case that we'd do a hike, where most people would still be walking. But we wanted to change things up, and progressed further up the mountain road to a trail a friend of mine had mentioned. We kept in mind our time, and figured that we could hike for a bit and simply enjoy the new environment, and finish up before it got too late. We arrived at the trailhead, and see that there were no cars left along the road where the trail commences. We didn't think too much of it though due to the time. We still had a good 45 minutes until dark, so we troopered on. We started walking down a fairly steep hill that then recoups the elevation at the bottom with an equally steep hill that you have to ascend. We reach the top, and then it's smooth sailing from there on out. We see a lone coyote off the trails a way off, and some rabbits, and I made a quip about how those rabbits might need to be careful with that coyote lurking around. She playfully hit me for that one. Approximately less than a mile into the trail, we see a large fallen tree that made a bridge over a dried riverbed, and decided to take a rest, climb around on it, and take pictures. We were there for roughly 10 minutes, and then resumed hiking. We continue on the trail for a short distance, until she hears a rustle in the trees behind us. We stop, mildly spooked, due to the assumed size of whatever made the rustling but continue on only briefly before she decides she's done, and that we need to head back. It's twilight now, so I agree with her, so we turn around and head back to the car. When we made it back to the fallen tree, my shoe had come untied, so I used the trunk to fix my loose laces, and look behind us for the first time on the hike, which is uncharacteristic of me, but hey, I was having fun, and there was no need to be paranoid. I see a person dressed entirely in black, with their hood on. That was a significant distance behind us, walking at a slow, even pace. It wasn't something out of the ordinary, so what if they're wearing black with their hood on? I wear black most of the time, and it's cold out. I shouldn't make assumptions, right? This does trigger me to be more alert, however, and I inform my girlfriend of this person's presence. It's dusk now. We continue on at an intentionally faster pace, and go through a winding section of the trail, and I lose sight of the person. When we come around the final bend of the section, I figure that they're far behind us now, and that there's nothing to worry about. Sooner than later, the person is behind us again, but significantly closer, probably 50 feet in comparison to 100 feet before. And we had increased our speeds, so this alarmed us. We briskly walked around another bend, and as soon as we had come around it, we book it. It seemed to be a natural reaction on both our parts, as we started running without a word to initiate it. We're nearing the trailhead now, with only the hills to deal with, we catch our breaths for a moment, and I turn around again. I see the person seemingly halt in a sprint, upon noticing me look back, as if they were trying to uphold the illusion that they were simply walking. At this point I shout, Go! And we sprint down the hill. What little light was left, struggled to make its way through the dense trees surrounding us and the steep hill proved challenging to run down without a clear path to be seen. We stumbled down the hill, almost falling multiple times and slamming our feet onto the rocks and loose brush. But we didn't fall, and we didn't look behind us. We make it to the bottom, but must continue up the initial hill, and then we would have made it out. We persevere up the incline, and make it back to our car. I briefly breathe in relief as I start my car. Heart pounding, and adrenaline racing as I reverse onto the road. 
The person emerges at the trailhead, apparently breathing heavily. We finally catch a glimpse of him. His hood had fallen off his head, exposing his pale complexion and dead eyes that were only illuminated by a single lantern at the start of the trail. He was holding something in his hand, but it was too dark to see, and I was not interested in sticking around to make out the object. I shift into drive and accelerate as fast as my car could muster, leaving him behind in the dust of the empty side of the road. Night trail dude, let's not meet again. I work for a well-known university as a field biologist, and have recently been contracted out to the National Forest Service. For my first assignment, I received GPS coordinates, and I either had to drive or hike to the designated spot and do what they wanted me to do. This could be setting up trail cameras and or counters, monitoring equipment, trail surveys and the like, and then recording the data 24 hours after placement. No big deal. I thought it odd that they specifically requested I place the cameras only three feet off the ground, and some of the infrared cameras in the trees at specified heights. Some of these locations are on designated trails, but others are way off trail in places that humans would never go. Sometimes there isn't a hotel or lodging close enough, as these are in very remote mountains, and the Forest Service has outfitted me in some pretty dang camping gear on the occasion I may have to camp. I am an experienced hiker and camper, and have spent many nights alone out in the field due to my career choice. I am a woman of about 5 foot 6, 130 pounds, but not really afraid of anything. Again, the Forest Service has outfitted me well, and I wear an emergency beacon that will send every law enforcement officer in the area to my location in no time. So I've been assigned to this district for a few months now, and have really enjoyed my work. This is a very remote and unspoiled area, and that's why I do what I do. I get to see things most people wouldn't, and I've had so many positive and almost spiritual moments up until a few nights ago. I was working up near one of the highest points in the state, with a complex system of trails, wilderness areas and camping. It has also been snowing with howling winds and ice storms, and I was camping up there to complete my work, and while the conditions were rough, I was almost enjoying it. My first night in the woods was pretty peaceful. I made dinner, set up camp, and drank some whiskey, and smoked some really good bud. I snuggled down in my sleeping bag and slept like a rock. It was very cold, but I wear this turtle fur face mask thing, and don't feel the cold all that much. I woke up at dawn, and went about building my fire back up, and starting some coffee when I noticed all this churned up snow around my campsite. Not tracks, just churned up snow like someone, or something, had kicked it all around. Weird, but whatever. I had a 15 mile hike to set some cameras, and didn't really have time to wonder about it. I set off on my hike, did what I had to do, and started back to camp. I never wear earbuds or anything, because hearing is one of the most important senses in the wilderness. I want to be able to hear any animals, people, or anything before I see them. It was already past dark when I arrived back to my camp, and I was too tired to do anything except strip down to my base layer, get into my sleeping bag, and pass out. Around 2am, I woke up because I could hear people talking. People? I was around 30 miles up a gravel road that was locked with forest service gates and about 10 miles from where my truck was parked, and I could hear voices. I completely lost it. I have a firearm and I quietly retrieved it from my pack and got back in my sleeping bag and cocked it and waited. I was on high alert. All of my senses were going wild. Eventually the voices faded, and I couldn't hear them anymore. 
but I never went back to sleep. At daylight, I emerged from my tent to more churned up snow, and my two trail cameras hanging from a tree about five feet from my tent. Cams that I had placed 15 miles out from my campsite. I packed my stuff up as fast as I could and hauled ass back to my truck. Along the way, I saw a lot of human boot tracks all around my campsite, and when I reached my truck, I discovered it had been broken into and my computer and other equipment had been stolen. I am currently in a luxury log cabin at some resort, too scared to retrieve my other equipment and too embarrassed to tell my superiors how scared I am. The forest service bought me a new truck while my other one is getting the window replaced. And I did make a report about the theft, but there's no way in hell I'm ever going back to that site. And so I finally went back to retrieve my equipment and the two cams that were hanging near my site. I took a friend who's a former Marine with me and the equipment I placed was undisturbed. But the two cams that were hanging near my campsite were both missing their memory cards. I didn't tell my supervisors how scared I was, but I did say that someone had messed with the cameras and stolen the memory cards. I also requested to never be sent back to that site again. I will still work that area, but never anywhere near as remote. I truly hope it was just teenagers looking to steal and maybe have some fun at my expense. Every person I've met around here has been exceptionally nice, even if most do hate the National Forest Service. I don't know if this means I will be fired or sent to work at a desk, but out of all of the years I've been doing this in national forests around the country, this is the most terrified I have ever been. And I'm not scared of animals, and I have many stories to share about my encounters with them. But what I am scared of a people. My mum's family used to live in the countryside in the northern region of Colombia. It was the late 70s or early 80s. I don't know exactly when. My grandpa had his own farm. He wasn't a big landowner though, but he owned a small farm in the middle of the Serrania. He has worked since he was 11 years old because my great grandfather died when he was just a kid. During all his teenage years, he learned everything related to farming, how to tame horses, herd cattle, grow plants and whatnot. And he was indeed very knowledgeable on agriculture since they lived amidst the dense jungle. It was normal to hear witches laughing or whistling and hearing the screams of La Llorona. Not only that, it was a tight knit community. Everyone knew each other and knew each other's business. My grandpa used to work for the big landowners of the region. However, there was one he always refused to work with. It was an extremely wealthy landowner. He had a number of heads of cattle, horses, and it was said that he also had thousands of hectares of land where he cultivated rice, potatoes, yams and cassava. There was a rumor going around that this guy got all his possessions overnight by making a deal with the devil. Locals wouldn't work for him. Most people who did were unsuspecting foreigners who ignored the whole story. They were seduced by the high wages they were offered compared to those that they would have made if they'd have worked anywhere else. Most of the foreigners learned quickly about the boss's wrongdoings. But if we take into account that Colombia back then was even more of a shithole than it is today, what other option did they have? It was that or perish from starvation. Everyone was aware that one of the clauses of the deal was that the landowner had to sacrifice the life of one of his employees and give his soul to the devil. Every single year at around the same time, 
August. They would find one of his workers dead near the river, every year. And as you might think, this couldn't last forever. And the landowner's luck came to an end, when all his employees started to quit. They moved to the main cities, found other jobs with other landowners. And this in part was also triggered by the guerrillas and gangs forcing people from their homes. The landowner suddenly found himself completely alone. He couldn't find anyone to take care of his crops or cattle. So he started to sell everything but his mansion. And then August came. My grandpa and uncles told me that it was a horribly gloomy day. And that that night, a huge storm, the likes of which they had never seen before, broke into their area. They heard deafening thunders and dreadful screams of agony that made their houses rattle and saw horrendous lightning illuminating the pitch black skyline. Everything ceased at 3am, so they could barely catch up on sleep that night. Once the sun rose in the morning, everyone started their usual day. But that same day, they were told that the landowner had been murdered. The whole town then rushed to his mansion. And what they found was so gruesome and spine chilling, that up to this day, it sends shivers down their spine. The landowner was strapped to an oak tree, beheaded, and his entire body seemed to have been split in half with a saw. People who talked to him during his last days said that he was going crazy, and he often talked about a fight with the devil. Therefore, everyone thinks that the landowner challenged the devil to a duel to the death, and he literally got smashed to pieces. I was doing a long hike from Springer Mountain to Fontana Dam, that's about 165 miles. I was a little behind schedule on day three, where I had planned to take a near zero day and spend some time at mountain crossings. Initially, I was going to spend night two in the hostel there, but a big storm prevented me from crossing Bloody Mountain the day before. As a result, I had to revamp my plan and add about seven miles to my day. So after a soda and a burger at Mountain Crossing, I hit the trail again. I came to a road crossing, and there's this guy with an old 80s style external frame pack taking a break. Being me, I stopped, pulled out a cliff bar and a smoke, and decided to have a conversation for a bit. I could use the break anyway. We talked for a bit, and I alluded to which shelter I was heading to. Do not do this if you don't trust the person. That was my first mistake. The guy seemed a little odd, but this was the Appalachian Trail. Everyone is weird. At that point, we're all walking to Maine. We started talking about 1pm. He had started his day at Neil's Gap, and I started on the other side of Blood Mountain. We'd started at roughly the same time, and I had taken a two hour break. My pace easily put me ahead of this guy by seven or eight miles. The shelter I had alluded to was actually out of his range, or so I thought. There were also three shelters between us and my final destination. We parted ways, and I kept on trucking. I get to camp and do my usual thing. I made good time, so I actually had quite a bit of downtime before hike at midnight, which is 8pm. Several hours had passed, and I had peppered for the night, and was reworking my plan while talking to the other hikers. And this guy rolls into camp, looking like he had just gone on the Bataan Death March. He trucked it up to try and catch me up. The guy started to show his true colours in camp. 
He was really loud and obnoxious and would not leave me alone. I decided that night I would carry a bit of extra water and do breakfast outside of camp to try and distance myself away from him. The next morning, I was up just before sunrise. I packed and hit the trail. Then, two miles later, I tweaked my knee on some rock crossing. Ugh, that did it. I needed to get some rest and ice on this thing. I go to the gap where you can either hitch west into Hiawisi, where most people go, or hitch east into Helen. I decided to go into Helen as I figured I'd also take advantage of the Bavarian atmosphere that the town provides. Lo and behold, a few hours later, this same guy comes rolling into my hotel. I found out later he had asked some southbounders about me and figured out where I'd gone. Holy crap. Now this is creepy. I had to get him away from me. I figured while in town, I'd kill him with kindness. So I got some beers and made some more conversation. We were talking about our plans and I knew this was my chance. I told him that because of my knee, I was probably gonna take the next day off as well and continue on after that. He said he'd join me, just like I expected. I said cool and went to my room. As soon as I got to my room, I packed up and set my alarm for 4.30 a.m. I phoned the owner of the hotel to make sure she could give me a ride to the trail that early. The next morning, I quietly grabbed my gear and hopped into her car. We headed the few miles up the road to the trailhead and I basically started running. I never saw the guy again, but I heard stories about him up the trail. That was a hell of a trip. I had a bear bed down within arm's reach of me in my tent. That's a story for another day though. I haven't done a long hike in a few years. Telling these stories really does make me want to get back into the trail. Perhaps I will in summer. From roughly 2000 to 2005, I lived on the south edge on Northern Virginia. This was a rural area with houses set far apart from each other, surrounded by fairly dense woods. There was a phenomenon that I came to call the woodwalkers. Due to insomnia, I had a bad tendency to stay up very late at night, sometimes all the way until dawn. Frequently, I'd leave the window partially open all night long in order to let a cool breeze in. On some occasions late at night, well after midnight, I'd hear something loudly crashing through the woods behind the house. It always sounded like a large man staggering drunkenly through the woods, always along the same path from the direction of the driveway down towards the Bull Run River. The leaves would be rustling very loudly, as if a large person were carelessly dragging their feet along the ground. Branches would be snapping, as if the person was lurching blindly through the forest. I couldn't tell if it was one person or several people, but the passing through the woods always created an alarming amount of noise. I came to expect to hear the woodwalkers every two weeks or so. And after a while, whenever I heard the noise of woodwalkers, I would peer out the window trying to discern who or what was making all the noise at such a late hour. I never saw a thing, no outlines of figures, and no glow from a flashlight. The really strange thing about this to me is that the apparent path they were traversing through came from nowhere and went nowhere. They just stumbled through the woods, apparently tearing their own path through the wilderness, going deeper into the woods. It's also bizarre that they would go crashing through the deep dark woods at 2am or 3am when it's pitch black without using a light source. It seems impossible to me that anyone could find their way through the woods in the dark like that. On one particular occasion, I heard the woodwalkers behind the house. Then I heard a branch of gunshots from directly behind it. It sounded like a handgun to me. 
and the next morning I wandered around the edge of my yard searching for expended brass, but didn't find anything. I found no trace or signs of anyone passing through the woods. In the days after the gunshots, I became increasingly determined to solve the strange mystery of the woodwalkers. I put a flashlight on a small dresser by my door. I patiently waited night after night to hear the woodwalkers come staggering through the woods. Sure enough, one night, I heard the familiar sound of something crashing eerie and slowly through the woods behind the house. I leapt up and rushed to gather the things I intended to carry outside with me, as I went to confront whatever it was that passed through the woods. I frantically pulled off my sweatpants and put on my jeans. I searched for my keychain, then unlocked the lockbox in which I kept my pistol. I loaded my ammunition into the pistol and tucked it into my belt. I grabbed my flashlight and quietly descended into the basement, then out the back door into the backyard. It took me far too long to get outside. By the time I cautiously strode out under the moonlight, I could hear the noisy movement of the woodwalkers receding into the distance. I walked slowly and stealthily out onto the edge of the woods and pulled my pistol out my belt. I crept soundlessly down the hill into the dark woods. I positioned myself defensively behind a large tree in case the woodwalkers carried firearms. I peered warily into the direction of the noise, my eyes strained to see whatever it was that was out there, but I could discern nothing through the shady branches of the forest. After a while, I pointed my flashlight towards the direction of the noise and turned it on. My night vision was instantly ruined by the reflection of light from the tangled mass of trees and branches. I turned the light off and listened to the sound of the woodwalkers fade away, and I went back inside in defeat. To this day, I wonder about the strange mystery of the woodwalkers. I'll never know who or what it was. This experience was legit one of the most terrifying things that's happened to me while walking my dog, and he's done some weird stuff. So back in 2015, I had a choice of getting a dog or getting a smartphone. I'd never had a dog in my life or a decent smartphone come to think of it. And I'd been saving up for a phone anyhow. So naturally I picked the dog. My dad knew a fellow who had a couple of border collies that recently had a litter. So we drove out, the dude gave me the last pup and enter Bailey. A couple of weeks later, he got his shots, and I started walking him. My parents figured I was going to be hanging out at the local park with my new pup, so I could get him socialized. But no. I chose to take him around the perimeter of a nearby farm to keep the farm dog in him. I'd been sneaking out to this farm for years. The farmer was an old family friend, and my uncle had grown up working with him. So I knew if I were ever caught, I would just drop their name. On either side of the farm, there was some thick woodland, which no one had ever given me reason to be wary of. They probably should have. So it's a sunny afternoon. It had been pouring down all week, and Bailey was itching for a good walk. I take him to the farm at our usual time, and we start making our way around the woods on the east side of the farm. Everything is quiet, but Bailey keeps darting away for me to explore. He's a puppy. It's what they do. But of course, I'd been calling his name all the way around the field. We're about halfway past the woods and I could see the roof of the farmhouse over the next hill. Bailey's been pulling crap out of the bushes all the way along, and I just gave him into trouble for rolling in a pile of fox crap. That's when I heard a man's voice calling my dog's name. 
like this dude I didn't even know was calling my dog by name. I knew it wasn't the farmer because I'd met him at family events like barbecues and weddings, so I knew what he sounded like. I go completely silent, but the guy keeps calling my dog. It sounds like he's deep into the woods and maybe moving, but he's calling my dog with such an excited tone in his voice, and that is what creeps me out the most. Bailey, meanwhile, is completely ignoring this guy and sniffing a now flat pile of poop. I'm a tiny 18 year old girl. The most combat experience I have is a month learning Taekwondo when I was 11. And I don't have a mobile phone. If that guy works out where I am, I'm screwed. And if Bailey decides to go after him, I'm double screwed because I'm not letting this possible psycho get his hands on my puppy. I can either run to the farm, which isn't too far away, or run back through the fields towards home. I pick up my dog and sprint across the fields. Behind me, I hear someone emerge from the woods, but I'm already over the fence and sprinting back home with my puppy tucked under my arm. I get home and tell my mum. She brushes it off as some weird drunk guy. A few weeks later, I'm at my uncle's house and the farmer walks in. I had told my uncle what happened, so he brings it up. The farmer asks exactly which woods I'd been close to and that some of his clothes had gone missing from his washing line. He put it down to strong winds, but now he's not sure. I take him and my uncle to the exact spot the next day and all three of us go in and find a completely wrecked campsite. There's no clothes or anything, but the tent had collapsed in on itself. There's no fire, but there are some empty gas canisters, like the ones you'd use for portable stoves and empty packets of food scattered everywhere. We reported it to the police, but nothing really came of it, except that I got a phone not long after and kept it on me whenever I went out. I was going through a tough time and just wanted to be alone. We have a woods besides our house. So I decided to ride my dirt bike out there at night, sit by the fire and just chill with some music. About an hour or so later, I wanted to change up the music. So I grabbed my iPod and started to surf through some songs until I found something that I liked. Now, I forgot to mention it, but at night the woods are pitch black out there, even with a fire, so you can only see a few feet around you. Basically, you and the fire are the only ones around in a sea of darkness. I switched songs and turned back to the fire. I froze. On the other side of the fire, a large form with pointed ears loomed in the darkness. The only reason I noticed it was because of the glowing eyes reflecting the flames that burned between us. This thing was huge. I'm about six feet tall, and it was taller than I was. I stood there paralyzed in fear as for what seemed like minutes stretched between us, only the music breaking the dead silence. Now I live in Ohio, so there aren't a whole lot of tall animals with pointy ears in the woods. We have no bears of any kind or wild animals in the area that are bigger than a deer. The thing before me was definitely no deer, and at the moment I didn't think it was human either. During our silent standoff, my brain finally recovered from shock and screamed for me to move. I quickly dropped everything in my hands, including my phone and iPod. I jumped on my dirt bike and tried to start it. And just like in the horror movies, it wouldn't start. Dread filled me and I could feel my face pale. The engine turned over really slow as if the battery was dead. I thought my heart would break my ribs. It was pounding so hard. Luckily, it has a Kickstarter as a backup though I've never had any luck kickstarting it. I guess luck was smiling down on me that night because with a hard kick, it started and I flew through the woods as fast as I could. 
Looking back on it now, I'm guessing whatever it was could have attacked me at the same time. I don't know if it had already left during my panicked escape, or if it was still watching me with those fiery eyes as I fled. Once I got up to the house, I told my parents about what happened, and asked my dad to go back with me to grab my phone and iPod. However, it was really late, so he declined, and I guess he didn't believe me. Now, don't ask me why I would go back after escaping with my life, but I really wanted my stuff. I ended up calling my friend who lives nearby, and he agreed to come to my assistance. My friend and I went back out into the woods with, and I kid you not, swords and a disposable camera to get my stuff. I took the camera with us just in case I would be fortunate enough to snap a picture of whatever was out there with me. As I was snapping pics in one hand, then holding a sword in the other, we approached the site and gathered my things. The thing was nowhere in sight. As we were walking back up to my house, we noticed the neighboring house was lit up. However, it wasn't house lights. It was on fire. We dialed 911 and ended up finding out it was an abandoned house that caught fire. Now I'm not sure if it had anything to do with what I saw, but it sure was weird to have happened all in one night around the same time. Until this day, I have no idea what animal would be taller than me and would approach a fire and music. Not sure if it was some kind of weird creature or possibly a person in a mask. I still have the disposable camera sitting on my desk. I haven't gotten around to getting them developed but I think that maybe I should. A lot of time has passed, and I still occasionally do go out into the woods, but I can't help but wonder if the thing is still out there, watching me. I'm a man in my mid-thirties, living in a forest area of West Virginia. I had just gotten a German Shepherd puppy from the dog pound, and needless to say, I watched her like a hawk. I didn't want anything to happen to her. Unfortunately in life, things don't often go the way we'd like them to, do they? She escaped a week after I got her. It wasn't that I'm not a good owner, but she must have gotten interested in something and ran away. I put up lost dog posters everywhere, but no one called despite the $5,000 cash reward I had offered anyone who found her. I soon got discouraged. It was hard to believe that I would never see her again. And one night, I was sitting in front of the TV absentmindedly, just thinking about stuff, when I heard a familiar bark. I reacted out of foolish excitement and burst out my door, and I heard the bark again coming from the woods. Without thinking, I ran into the forest, shouting her name. With no response, I took the time to figure out where I was. I was deep in the woods, and I had no light except my phone, as well as no sense of direction. I began to panic, and I suddenly forgot all about my dog. And then I heard an ungodly shriek. It echoed and faded. I was so terrified I thought I would pass out. I kept walking and soon found myself on a dirt road. It seemed wide enough for a car, and I started making my way down it. And then I saw headlights again. In the darkness, I couldn't see the car. I couldn't even see two feet ahead of me, but I was sure I was looking at headlights. I ran towards them, waving and making a stupid amount of noise. The headlights remained still, and then they blinked. That's when I knew they weren't headlights. I stopped cold in my tracks and almost cried. The eyes lifted higher, but whatever the creature was, it was tall, at least nine feet, and around twenty feet ahead from me. I didn't want to run. I didn't think I could in my state of fear. Instead, being the idiot I am, I turned on my phone and aimed the light at it. He was wearing a red plaid shirt and jeans. 
His skin was a greyish colour, and something was horribly wrong with his face. I just screamed, dropped my phone and ran like hell. I didn't care where I ran, I knew I just had to get away from that thing. I looked back. It remained there, eyes glimmering, making no attempt to chase me. I eventually found my way back to civilization, and spent the night in an older couple's home and told them the story. Oh yeah, the old man said, leaning back in his chair as I described the creature. I've met a few folks who have seen that thing. Round here, we call him the Bubba Jacks. He's kind of a legend around these parts. I really hope not to run into it again. This happened to my father-in-law 10 years ago at our hunting camp in Alabama. It popped into my head as we were heading there tomorrow for a few days of deer hunting and he told me to go ahead and share his story. As some people probably know, we get out an hour or so before light and climb into a tree stand, a ladder leading up to a seat in a tree, usually fairly deep in the woods to hunt. This foggy morning, my father-in-law had been in his stand for a few hours, and it was getting light, and he was reading a book as he waited for something to happen. Out of the fog, he hears a woman's voice, much closer than anyone should have been to him at the time. She's calling, Hunter, oh Hunter. Very sing-songy, like a mother calling her child in for dinner as he played outside. Now, as I said, he is pretty deep in the woods and there are sticks and dried leaves everywhere. You generally make a pretty good racket getting to your stand, which is why we go out so early. Not only that, but in order to know where he was and spot him camouflaged in a tree, she must have seen his light when he walked out, followed him into the woods, and waited hours before calling him. His first thought was that maybe the woman was calling someone called Hunter, perhaps her son. She called again, Hunter, oh Hunter. And he realized that he is the hunter. So he turns around, peers around the trees, and sees a young woman. She, in very few words and halting speech, explains that something is wrong with her hot water heater, and asks if he can come and have a look. Now, the strangeness of the situation hadn't set in yet, and he's a give the shirt off his back kind of guy. Not to mention he's six foot two, nearing 300 pounds and has a gun. So he wasn't too worried about this small woman and starts getting down the tree to go have a look. He follows her back to her mobile home, which borders our hunting land, probably a 10 minute walk away. She walks inside and leaves the door open. He's trailing behind a little, so he gets to the door, kind of knocks, and sticks his head in and says hello. Where he entered is a laundry room, and he can see there in the room is a hot water heater, and water is just pouring out the valve at the bottom, just absolutely pouring onto the floor. He walks over, turns the valve off, sticks his head in the house to say hello, and nothing. No one answers. The house seemed empty. Empty of people anyway, but it was a disaster inside. At this point, he's starting to see how strange it all is, and decides that this is just the sort of situation that could get you robbed, or worse, and nopes the hell out of there and hurried back to our cabin. Now, we have hunted in this land for years since, and have never seen anyone at this place. Although until this season, it has shown obvious signs of been lifting. So every time I pass by her place, which backs up right to the road we take to our hunting stands, I think lady in the trailer with the messed up plumbing, who may or may not have had nefarious intentions for my father-in-law, please, let's never meet.
Nothing has made me not want to go back into the woods, but I've had some strange experiences and seen some disturbing stuff. I've walked into two marijuana grows and into one still site. I backed away slowly from all three. The marijuana sites were strange because it took me a minute to realize what I was seeing. When you're picking your way through fairly thick vegetation, a plant is a plant until it isn't. I did have an unexplained sitting of a creature about seven years ago. I'm not sure what that was. I'm trained in animal identification by tracks, scat and sight. It honestly looked a lot like the Bigfoot you hear about in stories. I actually was walking into a spot where I duck hunt. It had snowed several days before and had frozen slash thawed a few times. So there was a really thick crust on the snow. I'm a big guy and could easily walk on top without breaking through. As I walked along a farm path, I heard something in the forest to my right. Looking, I noticed a shape maybe 30 yards away, trying to hide behind a pine tree. I could see it clearly. It kept sliding to the left and peering out around the tree trunk. I stopped and it turned and ran away downhill, crossed the upper end of a frozen beaver pond, breaking through the ice and crossed an open field on the other side and disappeared into the woods. I lost sight of it before it broke through the ice and it scared me. Shaking, I drew my pistol and made my way back into the field on the far side of the beaver pond and looked at the muddy tracks where it came out of the water. They were just smudges. It wasn't even denting the packed frozen snow. I went down to the water to look at the broken ice. It was thick enough for me to stand on and I tried it. I went back to the tree that it was trying to hide behind. There was a limb that was across its face, so I knew I could get a height estimate. That limb was even with the top of my head when I was standing where it would have stood. I'm six foot, so that thing would have at least been six foot six or more. What was it? It was bipedal, stood at least six foot six. Maybe it was a person. What could possibly make a human cross a frozen pond in cold 10 degrees Fahrenheit weather, not knowing if the ice would support them or even how deep the water was? Then where did this now very wet person go into a 300 acre forest? There is still a logical explanation. I just don't know what it is. I have been mountain biking since I was 11. It was the only thing that I thought would make me stand out from the crowd and I was hooked. I moved to a smaller city when I was 15, which was surrounded by mountains and countless wild trails to explore. So I was thrilled when I finally found a riding buddy willing to take the risks. We went out riding all the time. He was born there so he knew a lot of trails and was very familiar with the suburbs. We lived in a very religious community. Traditions oblige that in a certain month, we have to abstain from eating and drinking anything from sunrise to sunset. Our cycling hobby was no excuse to this tradition. During this month, we limited ourselves to a 30 kilometer ride every two days in order not to cause ourselves physical harm or injury. As we were approaching the city limits returning from a ride, my friend urged me to check out this new trail he had discovered. And despite the exhaustion and dehydration, I obliged. We took a right turn into some woods. The trail was amazing, smooth dirt path, beautiful scenery and occasional jumps. We were absolutely carried away until the trail disappeared into fresh agricultural soil that was impossible to ride on. We hopped off the bikes to go back to our trail on foot. And as we walked back, I started to think this was a bad idea. 
maybe we shouldn't have gone too deep into the woods. We were in full mountain bike gear, flashy stuff, and easily noticeable from a distance. My friend was very calm though. We found our trail, and the second I lifted my leg to hop on my bike, some dude grabs my shoulder. Three guys with dirty clothes, scarred faces, and reeked of B.O. and cow shit. What are you doing here? The older guy starts. I was too scared to speak, and my friend handles these kind of situations better, so he did the talking. They started asking us all kind of questions about our bikes and gear, till one of them laid a hand on my friend's bike and dragging it from him. I remember his exact words. I'm sorry, but we're taking the bikes. Before we protested, he adds, are you fasting today or not? I answered that we were, well, we're not. And if you weren't fasting, we would have taken the bikes and slashed you guys up before sunset. They said it in such a cool and strange tone and topped it off with, stay safe out there. I was in awe. My friend told me he was about to pull out his knife when the guy grabbed his bike. I can only imagine what would have happened. I moved out of that city, picked up motorcycles, and we still ride together and joke about the encounter. I'm grateful it only turned out as badly as it did. I am an 18 year old male from Namibia, Africa. I experienced this in 2016, along with my older sister and girlfriend. It happened during the school holidays as we took a trip to my grandparents' farm. It was one of the places that we loved going to. One morning after having breakfast, my father informed my sister and I to go make a stop at another farmer's farm. He told us that we were to deliver a few farm tools to him that my granddad had supposedly borrowed. My sister perked up when she heard that we would take the car since the farm was a few kilometers away. My sister and I decided to let my girlfriend tag along since she still didn't know my family very well. As we were driving along the gravel road, we joked, talked about small things and other crazy stuff until we reached a road that had trees on either side of it. The trees grew in such a way that they blocked the sun's rays from reaching the gravel road. So we were basically driving under a large shade. I want to let all of you know that I'm very familiar with this part of the road, and I've driven through it many times before, and nothing strange has ever happened. But on this peculiar day, something was off. The birds that usually sang were quiet. Even the wind seemed to be silenced as we drove. By now, we were all quiet and just listening to the gravel beneath the tires of the car. We passed a large tree that had a white mark on its bark and I dismissed it as I have seen it many times before. And after a few moments, I realized that something wasn't right. I checked the time on the radio and it read 2.07. My eyes immediately went wide. We left our farm at 12.30. It never took us long to reach our neighbor. I was a little confused by this. Then my girlfriend said something from the back seat that confused me even more. Guys, didn't we pass this tree five minutes ago? I looked up, just in time to see us passing the same large tree with the same white mark on its bark. I knew something wasn't right, and I immediately looked at my sister, and she had a frown on her face that I couldn't exactly interpret. What the hell? I said out loud. We drove a little more, and we passed the same tree every time, until my sister got angry, and we came to a stop just a few feet away from the same tree. We got out, and were met with a deafening silence. My girlfriend got spooked, got closer to me, and I put an arm around her. Okay, what the hell is going on around here? My sister said. I don't know. We should have been at the guy's farm by now. We drove past this tree 
Twenty times, my girlfriend said. I'm no stranger to the paranormal. I've had weird experiences before, but nothing ever like this. I was incredibly freaked out, to say the least. As we got into the car again, we saw a red pickup truck drive slowly past us. My sister immediately started the car and closely followed the pickup truck. We drove through the wooded area just a few feet behind it, and after moments, we realized that the environment started to change. I sighed in relief as I saw the dam that was on the right side of the road. We were all glad we got out of there safely. I don't know if this was a loop or a glitch, but it was definitely paranormal. I know this sounds unbelievable, but I know what I experienced that day. We all did. We got home safely without any incident, but we never told our family or anyone else what happened. We have all heard stories of the area of the road being haunted, but I never believed them. After experiencing this, however, I can safely say that my point of view on the matter has changed. I used to do a lot of camping and hunting with my dad. We lived in Michigan, and going up north was a common activity for us. I think the main difference between us and other people who did the same thing was that my dad liked to go way off the beaten path, like really deep into the woods. Oftentimes, he would end up parking his truck somewhere once we couldn't go any further in, and would hike for several miles carrying all our gear. The last time we went camping was definitely the weirdest one. My dad was excited because he got a full wheel drive, brand new, and he wanted to see how far he could push it. After a lot of driving, some of it being scary and made me think I was going to die, we ended up in a small clearing. It was nearly dark at the time, so we quickly made up a tent had some food, and went to bed. When we woke up in the morning, we got a better idea of the clearing. It seemed to have been a common campsite, or that was the evidence. There was an area someone had a fire, firewood, and the grass was compressed in other areas, like someone had walked there for a while. I think there may have also been some trash. Further exploring around the area, I find what I called a swamp. It was a bed of water where trees and branches had fallen into or were growing out of. It had an eerie quality, but I was more afraid of snakes. After checking that out with my dad, we decided we were going to walk further into the forest, where the trees were thick and a truck couldn't get through. We were walking for maybe an hour when we came into another clearing. Before we even got there, we could hear something. As we approached, we found the source. We went immediately from a very dense forest into a very open area with low grass. Directly in front of us was a wooden cabin. In front of it were rusted out cars that seemed to be impossibly placed due to how dense the trees were. To the left of us was a cliff that just seemed to shoot straight down. Coming from the cabin was a lot of noise, and as we approached further, we could tell it was a woman screaming. What she was screaming I wasn't sure. I couldn't make it out, but she was obviously mad about something. I remember wanting to check out the cliff more, but my dad stopped me suddenly and stared like he was trying to figure something out, and told me to turn back immediately. We were practically running back to the campsite, and when we got there, he immediately had us pack up everything and get back in the truck to leave. I'm not sure what he saw or heard, but it was sure enough to scare him, which I had never seen before. We were both armed as well, 
and my dad had earned various medals in the army for rifle use and sharp shooting. He was an amazing shot, and when he had his hunting rifle, his bravery seemed to be endless. I think that's what's creeped me out the most. Whatever it was, he knew he couldn't protect me or himself from it. I lived in South Central Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania State Game Commission continues to deny the existence of mountain lions in the state of Pennsylvania, despite many, many sightings over the years. I've seen two, both in the area near my parents' rural town. The first sighting occurred when I was a teenager. It was just about dusk, and I planned on walking home from my grandmother's to my parents' house. I got about a halfway through the large field that I would cross to get to the path to my parents' house, when I noticed something moving along the tree line. Initially, I thought it was one of the neighbor's dogs, but it wasn't moving like a dog. I stopped to watch as it dawned on me what I was really looking at. It was a dusky, dark, tan cat, bigger than any cat I had ever seen. I realized what it was, and slowly backed up across the field and back to my grandmother's where I requested a ride home. The second was seen by multiple neighbors before we saw it out the window. This cat was much darker in color, almost black, but similar in size, and certainly not a bobcat. We've also seen rather large tracks when hunting two separate mountains in the area. Unsure why the game commission persisted that they are extinct and a fragment of everyone's imagination. But mountain lions are definitely out there in the Appalachia still. When I was 10, I was at a lake way out in the woods on some land my dad owned. I was alone aside from my dog, an Airedale Terrier. I'd been fishing on the little pier in the southeastern corner for about 10 minutes, when I noticed something or someone watching me from the tree line on the other side of the lake. I was only about 10, but I kept my composure. For some reason I felt it important that whatever slash whomever it was did not know that I was aware. Anyway. It started moving slowly from tree to tree, never taking its eye off me. The lake was about 75 yards wide, so I couldn't see any details, but I could tell which way the figure was facing. I realized that it was stalking me, and I nonchalantly put my pole down and walked down to the pier and up the bank towards the trail back to our cabin. Once I hit the tree line, I hauled ass to the cabin and waited there with one of my dad's guns until my parents got home. The only witness I had was my dog, and he saw it as well. I know because he was staring intently at the figure while giving a low growl until I quietly told him to stop. I have no idea who or what it could have been, but I now know its intentions were most definitely not good. In the early 90s, we didn't live there, as our home was in Mobile, Alabama, but we spent most weekends up there. I know it could have been a person, but the nearest neighbor was a very old couple that lived a few miles away. The closest paved road was a good 15 to 20 minute drive away from our land, aside from the lake and the open area our cabin was on. The surrounding area was a really thick forest. The figure was extremely tall as well. I have an extremely good memory, especially for details. Also, shortly before I actually noticed it, I got a very strong, I'm going to be watched by something dangerous feeling. I've never felt safe there again. 
and I was glad when my dad sold it and got a place near Gulf Shores. There's this forest near where I live. Flora and fauna is what we call it here. People used to walk through, have picnics and run in it. I used it to run there with my dad a lot, so I knew the paths quite well. And I usually go there to escape from reality and listen to my iPod. This whole thing started last year. I drove and parked in the parking lot of the place to revise my notes for an exam I had. While I was in the car, this guy was walking around the parking lot and kept passing my car and looking in at me. It was pretty creepy, so I left. Now today I went to the flora and fauna to go for a walk and listen to music. As soon as I pulled into the parking lot, I saw the same creepy guy sitting in his van. I park on the far side of the lot. There are two entrances to flora and fauna, a main one and a side one, and I was parked right next to the side one. I stayed in my car a few minutes, and get out, and walked through the side entrance, and I noticed that the creepy guy had also gotten out of his van. I decide not to walk down any of the smaller windy paths, and I turn into a small path that leads to the main path you cross right through the flora and fauna. This route I took was kind of unique, as in you wouldn't choose it usually, because you could just take the main entrance that goes directly onto the main path as it was quicker, and I was hoping that it would lead me away from the creepy guy, and to an area that had people in it. I noticed that he was taking the same path as me, so I walked faster towards this other woman, who is walking on the main path as well. He follows me to the main path too, and I message my friend and let her know what's up, and then call her. I stay behind this woman for about 10 minutes, and the guy is about 5 to 10 meters behind me. I keep glancing sideways to see how close he is. I stay behind this woman for about 10 minutes, and the guy is about 5 to 10 meters behind me. I keep glancing sideways to see how close he is. I get in front of the woman, and I'm about 200 meters from the other side of the flora and fauna, and there's this couple with a pram walking towards us. I look back, and the creepy guy has turned around. I stay on the phone with my friend until I get back to my car, and when I come back to the parking lot, the creepy guy is in his van, which has been moved and was a lot closer to my car. He watches me get in and drive away. So creepy guy, please, let's never meet again. One of my experiences happened on family land that we own in North Carolina, where I used to live. I still hunt, so it's never kept me from going again. We call it the noise. To this day, if you ask people who live, or lived, adjacent to the land about it, they know exactly what you're talking about. Whatever it is was very loud and very fast. It was like a very loud primal scream. The first time I heard it, I was hunting with my dad and brother. We were stork hunting and very, very slowly and methodically moving throughout the forest. I noticed everything had gotten oddly quiet. The only thing you heard was the water running over the rocks in the creek. My dad stopped us and said to hold still and not to move. As soon as we stopped, it screamed behind us. It was so loud it made my ears ring. My dad never showed fear and was always rational. He looked very nervous and I'm ready to shit on myself. My brother has his gun shouldered, looking around trying to spot it, just to see what it is, and make sure it isn't close. Then it screams again now. It seems closer and in front of us. My dad puts his hand on my shoulder, and just says run for the car now. 
I jump up like a scared rabbit and run as fast as my legs will carry me. We're all running and we can hear this thing screaming as we run, like it's keeping pace with us. I can see the gravel road ahead and know the car is close. It lets out another scream that sounds like it's on my left now and very close. I bolt right and we all come sliding out onto the road about a hundred yards above the car. That's when I hear this weird whistle from the woods and then everything just goes back to normal. Birds chirping away, squirrels calling, crows cawing, and we stopped to catch our breath and easily walked to the car ready for anything. A hundred yards never seemed so far away. That wasn't the last time we heard it. In fact, it happened many other times. My family tried to find it for many years to figure out what it was. We even trained hunting dogs, but they ran away from this. Weird stuff. But I still love to hunt and figure that if something gets me while I'm hunting, at least I'm doing something I love and being close to nature. In my college days about 20 years ago, me and a friend often took off for the North Georgia mountains on the weekend. When we wanted to smoke, drink and commune with nature, these mountains were perfect. On the weekend, this unsettling event occurred to me. My friend Bill and his German shepherd Monty headed out towards Sky Valley. It was the beginning of fall semester at UGA and not much was going on yet. We had found an area where a dirt road led back a half mile, and then we would hike in another mile or so and set up camp near a creek. Excellent trails were nearby with fun places to explore, not to mention flat ground perfect for setting up camp. Bill and I arrived at our spot around 4 p.m. and got a fire going. We were musicians, Bill a guitar player, and me a percussionist. So we sparked a joint and started jamming. Around 10, after jamming a while, we chatted about life and girls before tucking in for the night. It was a clear night, so we slept under a blanket of stars. It is important to note we never had seen any sign of another person in the area during any of our other trips. But at two in the morning, I was awoken by Monty growling. It was a deep, guttural growl. Bill was still dead to the world, and I sat up looking around and listening, thinking maybe an animal had come near our campsite. The fire was only embers at this point. I heard barely audible voices in the distance. Focusing on the area of the voices, I saw a faint, red glow, followed by another faint red glow to the left of the first. This was about a hundred yards away. My mind connected what I was seeing. Cigarette embers. They were getting closer. Bill, wake up. Bill roused from his sleep and I explained what was going on. At this point, Monty started barking as the strangers approached camp. By the time we stood up, they were in camp, completely unfazed by the now rabid 70 pound German Shepherd. Two incredibly unkept, late 30s, early 40s, deliverance looking guys walked up on us. Bill told Monty to calm down. I will never forget the look of these guys. Skinny as hell, about 5 foot 8, shirts caked in grime, mangy beards and probably five teeth between the two men. Each had huge knives attached to their belt buckles. What you boys doing out here? Look like you're having a good time. We responded and told them that we had been out here to camp and drink some beer. They asked if we had any weed and we gave them a joint. They looked around a bit and asked if we wanted to smoke with them. We declined saying we were heading out early. Throughout the conversation, anything Bill or I said they looked at each other before responding. Finally, before they left, one of them said, Y'all stay safe. You never know who you could run into out here. 
followed by a laugh as they walked away. We packed up early and left. While this isn't super creepy, these guys were the epitome of backward redneck. The fact that we only woke up because of the dog still sketches me out to this day. And I wonder if I hadn't have awoken or if the dog hadn't been with us or if this situation had been any part different, if our fates would have been different too. I'm glad we didn't have to find out. On October 21st, 2017, I was visiting my grandparents in Oklahoma. They live out in the country deep in the woods, and I have spent my whole life climbing over every inch of those woods. I've memorized every trail that I have made while walking through them. I have a favorite spot in the woods. It's a small clearing with giant five to 12 feet boulders all around it. It's a place that is very special to me, but although I can't explain it, whenever I go there, I have the weirdest feelings, like someone or something is watching me, or just a weird feeling in general. But I've always ignored the feeling until that day. I woke up that morning ready to go and just be out in the woods for a day to do some fishing and maybe some target practice with my BB guns. I took my phone so that I could film my favorite spot so that I could show my friends. I have been planning to have them out there for a couple of days. To get to my favorite spot, I have to go down into a ravine and then go up the other side. I started to make my way down the ravine. But at the bottom, I noticed something strange. There were bones everywhere at the bottom. Deer heads, deer legs, possum skulls, and a ton of bones in general. That was not totally unusual, because my uncle who hunts would usually dump the bones of deer everywhere. And the family dog, Buck, would also catch and kill possums, armadillos, and raccoons. So I ignored the bones and started to make my way to my favorite spot. After about 10 minutes of walking, I finally got up there and set down my stuff and pulled out my phone to record the area I was at. I started recording and talking to the phone, gesturing to my favorite areas and whatever. I then started to walk just a little ways to show more of the place. I was walking when I noticed a little stone structure in another clearing. I had been out there the day before and the structure had not been there. So I walked over and found myself in the center of a circle ring of rocks. I started to rotate when all of a sudden the woods stopped. I don't mean just birds, but the crunch of my boot on the ground, the wind and even my own breathing. Everything just stopped. But then I heard the weirdest thing. It was like my name was being whispered over and over again. And as I look around, to see where the sound was coming from, I focused on one tree. There, peeking out from behind it, was a tall, slim creature. It was completely black. Long arms, a long neck. But when I say it was black, it was all black. No other colors, like shadow black. And from what I could tell, it had no facial features and at least reached seven feet tall. But the weirdest part, it had no legs. It was a floating black torso with long arms and a long neck and no face. My usual fight or flight response is usually fight, but in this situation, something in my head told me that I would not be able to fight this. I turned and I sprinted out of that spot. I ran and I did not look back once. When I got to my grandparents' house, I immediately locked the doors and windows, or at least as many as I could and tried to send the video I recorded to my friends. But as I did so, my phone screen went blood red, then glitched and shut off. I tried two or three more times, but the same thing happened. My grandma had walked in and asked me what I was doing and why I looked so worried. I just played it off and said that I couldn't get a message to send, which was not entirely untrue. I was not able to sleep that night and I swear I could hear the faintest whisper of my name all night. I've never shown my family the video or told them about the incident. 
I've only shown that video to some best friends, and only two of them believed me. I've told the others about it, but no one really thinks it's true. I've been back out to my grandparents since then, but have not gone back near that particular spot without another person. I have had a few paranormal experiences in my life, but this one stands out in my mind. I am a 22 year old male, currently in my last semester of college. This story takes place during my freshman year at the same college. I go to a smaller university in Connecticut. It's located pretty much at the base of a popular state park with a large mountain. If you're familiar with Connecticut, I'm sure you can guess which university I'm referring to. There is a lot of Native American folklore associated with the mountains, as Native American tribes used to live in the surrounding area, and some weird stuff has definitely happened there. A kid even fell to his death while hiking not too long ago, but I highly doubt that was due to anything paranormal. Behind my freshman dorm building, there was a steep hill that led into the woods. This was where everyone in our building would go to smoke weed. Halfway up the hill, there was a little cleared out space with a concrete wall that you could sit on, and then a much larger area on the top of the hill with trails and a bigger concrete wall. It was a nightly occasion for my roommates and I to go up there and to smoke so we were completely fine for going at any time. One night, my roommate and I headed to the hill just like we did on most nights. Our other roommate stayed behind because he had to do work. We climbed the hill and went to the smaller clearing halfway up rather than the large one. There was no one else up there and it was a little later than we normally went. But like I said, we felt safe enough to go there at any time. We smoked a few bowls and just hung out for a while. Keep in mind, both of us smoked pretty regularly, so two bowls wasn't gonna do much for us, and I'm definitely not the type to get paranoid while stoned, so our sobriety, or lack thereof, was not an excuse for what happened. It was pretty windy that night, so all of the trees around us were loudly swaying. Out of nowhere, the wind completely stopped and the trees fell still. Then the leaves on the trees that were standing by very slowly and eerily fell to the ground, all at the same level and speed. We looked at each other and kind of nervously laughed. Suddenly, we were both filled with this sense of impending doom, like something was telling us to leave the woods immediately. I know this, because my roommate told me he felt the same way after the fact, and we grabbed our weed and fully fledged sprinted out of the woods and down the steep hill. As I was running down the hill, I fell backwards really hard and messed up my elbow. To be honest, it almost felt like I was yanked by something, but there's a definite possibility that I just slipped on the dirt because we were flying down this essentially vertical hill. I picked myself up and we ran into our dorm building, slamming the door behind us. After that, my roommate refused to go into those woods for the rest of the year. There were a few times where I went back up the hill and into those woods by myself, as I didn't feel like walking across campus to go to another spot. For the most part, it was fine. I didn't experience anything. But there were a few other times I would be up there around midnight and would suddenly be filled with the same impending doom feeling to tell me to leave. I haven't gone back to that area since, but I can still see the eerie way those leaves fell around us. Three years ago, I was hunting in Namaji State Forest in Minnesota. If you know anything about this area, there are wetlands everywhere. Swamps and sinkholes litter the land. It's like nothing I've ever seen. This land is tough and mean. And if you go in unplanned and do not mark your way, 
there's a good chance no one will ever see you again, as it was a foggy morning and the second week of deer opener, and I was trailing along. I had my rifle across my chest, with both hands on the scope, and just trying to find an area where I could see more than ten feet in front of me. The further in, I realised I was lost, and then the, oh shit, set in, as I walked a little further ahead, trying to get my bearing, and before I knew it, I stepped forward and sunk. I was up to my forehead in mud, and sinking, with my only anchor being my rifle butt and barrel, and just so happened to be wider than the sinkhole I managed to get myself in. My only hope was to pull myself out, and I tried for four and a half hours screaming my lungs off for help, and trying in vain to pull myself out, but every time I would pull, my rifle would sink lower and lower, jumping up and yelling to get a breath of air, then submerged in mud and sludge. After five hours, I came to terms that I was not going to get out. I was going to die in a sinkhole, and no one would ever find me. I just thought about my wife and my mum, and how much it was going to hurt them to never find my body, and go the rest of their lives without knowing what happened to me. I thought of my two girls, and how I'd wasted my life on a hunting trip, and that I was never going to be there for them anymore, and at that point, I probably looked like Leonardo DiCaprio from The Revenant, crawling through the snow. I was cursing, and praying, and cursing more, using my last bit of energy to get out. I thought, if I'm gonna die, I'm gonna make damn sure I exuberate every fibre of my being before I entomb myself in this literal hellhole. Again, no luck. And out of nowhere, this feeling of euphoria just rushed through my body. I was sad but happy at the same time, and understood it was my time to go, and my body was broken. I was beginning to feel hypothermia set in, and out of nowhere, I felt these two pair of hands grab mine that were still clenched to my rifle, and I slowly started getting pulled out of the sinkhole. A father and a son had tracked a deer they shot to within five feet of where I sank, and to this day, that deer has made me feel like a god is out there, and it was my guardian angel where it ended its life, and I was reborn and given a second chance. After a week at the hospital recovering from dehydration hypothermia, and the ass kicking I gave myself, I walked out there promising myself I'll never take a second for granted. It's made me a better father to my children, and a better man. I truly believe that. I still wake up at night, screaming with rage I had, trying to pull myself up, sinking deeper and deeper covered in sweat, with my heart pounding. And when I do, I go check on my now three girls, and just think how lucky I am to still be alive. And lastly, I have given up hunting, or even going into the deep woods. Maybe one day I will try my luck, but every time I think about it, I just start shaking. Even writing this has me in tears. On a side note, a man from the Twin Cities this last hunting season disappeared in the very same area I was hunting. Look it up if you don't believe me. Every time I would see his face on the news or in the paper, I can just imagine him in my head, struggling to get out. But unfortunately for him and his family, he has not been found. The only reason I am still here today was my rifle and how I held it across my chest. My husband and I are amateur mushroom hunters. Three seasons out of the year, we spend weekends in forests along nature trails and rivers looking for edible and interesting wild mushrooms to harvest. Springtime brings the most exciting hunt, which is for the highly coveted morels. We know of a special stretch of shoreline along the river that has a few dozen morels each year. It's difficult to get to, as it's off the proper path, and you have to do quite a bit of ducking, climbing, and maneuvering to get to it. One day, two years ago, we were doing just that, 
making our way slowly and searching carefully for the mushrooms hiding in plain sight. We were so preoccupied with our task that we did not know how long we were being watched or followed. But at one point, we saw a man up ahead of us, looking at us and not saying anything or moving, almost like he was waiting to be noticed. My husband saw him first and turned to shoot me a look, because we never encountered anyone in that spot before. It was besides a small and fairly busy park, but people didn't stray from the paved paths much. There was a weird energy about the man that can be best described as vaguely menacing. We were near the end of where we wanted to look. Anyway, so we turned around and started walking our way back. When we looked behind us a few moments later, the man was gone. We wrote it off as just some weirdo, perhaps a homeless guy who's territory had been wandered into. We continued looking over the spots we had already covered in case we'd missed any morels, with me in front and my husband right behind me. Looking back every few places, as we were feeling more paranoid as we went along. All of a sudden, I look up from the ground at my feet and the man is blocking our path about 30 feet ahead. He had to have taken the riverbank and crept up alongside us on the path in order to get ahead of us, so that he could cut us off the way he had. I whipped around with huge eyes at my husband, who looks over my shoulder, sees him, and starts to move up the hill on our right as the riverbed was to our left, grabbing my hand to pull me with him. Adrenaline shot us out of the thick brush and onto the paved path in the open park. Without speaking, we broke into a sprint towards the direction of our car, several blocks away. When we were far enough away from the riverbank to risk a backwards glance, we saw the man emerge from the brush. He just stood there watching us leave, motionless. We speculated the entire ride home what he wanted from us, knowing it was nothing innocent. To this day it still bothers me, and I wonder what would have happened if we had been spread apart further while we hunted, or if either of us had been alone. I don't think I want to find out. I had recently begun helping my mum sell my childhood home, and it sparked the memory of possibly the scariest thing that's happened to me. Me and my friends were 15. I grew up in a subdivision, about 20 minutes away from any towns. It was a very safe neighbourhood, street lights on the corners, lots of kids, lots of classmates lived there, and there was never any fear of us walking to each other's houses or staying out after dark. My subdivision was about three miles long, and I lived at the very end of it. The last mile is a sharp right turn into a hill and has thick woods along both sides of the street, with four houses at the bottom, all surrounded by woods. My friend Maddie lived at the entrance to the subdivision. One year, we got about eight inches of snow and ice. It shut down the roads and people were stranded. Schools closed for a week. The first day of this snow, me, Maddie, and Kelly spent the whole day playing. We decided to have a big sleepover at Maddie's house that night. When the sun looked like it might start setting, we started the trek down to my house to get an overnight bag. By the time we'd finished packing, it was dark out. The woods always looked enchanting in the darkness, but it didn't bother us. The three of us start walking, joking, enjoying the night air, as we cleared the top of the hill, and then we saw something that made us stop in our tracks. A hooded figure, standing on the corner, illuminated only by the streetlights. They didn't move. They stood completely stiff, staring straight ahead. It was unsettling, but it easily could have been a neighbour, so with nervous laughs, 
we started descending the hill. The figure never moves, staring straight ahead. As we got to the bottom, we could see the hood was fur-lined, and they had some sort of black mask hiding their features. We began to get nervous. At this point, we're even with this person. It's dark now, and there's only one street lamp illuminating the corner. After staring at the figure for a solid 45 seconds, Maddie finally calls out, Hey, stop messing with us, it's not funny. At this point, the figure moved, only shuffling its feet to turn its body in our direction. They extended their hand towards us. Time stopped, and I could feel my heartbeat in my throat. The figure gestured, Come here, to us, before turning and walked into the woods. We ran as fast as our feet would take us, until we reached Maddie's house and deadbolted the door behind us. I stopped at the corner where the figure had been, and felt pure fear. There were two tracks of footprints, one leading out of the woods, and one leading back in. This story happened in summer of 2005, when I was 14 years old. I grew up in a village near Munich in southern Germany. It was maybe the safest and most peaceful place on earth. As a few young families fleeing the stupid rents in the city, and a few elderly couples. Close to my parents' house, there is a little nature reservation maybe around two to three kilometers in size, with a forest and a few little lakes. The entrance isn't forbidden, but there's no path leading deeper into the area, and it can be quite overgrown and wet, so normally nobody would go deep inside. However, I've always had an affinity for the wild and natural places like that, especially as I was allowed to play outside and alone. I soon started exploring it, and it became my favourite playground. One day, I was around nine. I found a small clearing deep within the forest, covered by a flower meadow. In late summer, it just looked like paradise itself. Over the next years, I came there whenever I wanted to be alone, when I needed time for reading, dreaming, and drawing, and when I grew older, also sunbathing and other stuff. During all the time, I never told anyone about it, and I never saw a single sign of other people there. The meadow was my secret, and I felt as safe as I did at home. Years later, I went back just for some reading and sunbathing at the meadow, and since I never saw anyone else there, I mostly stayed topless while doing so, as when I woke up, I saw an old 50-year-old man sitting directly behind me. He was maybe one metre eight right in height, dressed in light outdoor clothing, and had a camera around his neck. I got the shock of my life, and yelled and tried to somehow cover myself, but all my clothes were out of reach, and all I could do was press myself to the ground. He himself was just sitting there looking at me, and told me how beautiful I was, and glad he got to see me again. I asked him to turn around and allow me to get my clothes, but he said, No, you don't really need to be ashamed, I just want to chat for a bit. The man told me about his life, and asked casual questions. Where do you live? What's your name? How's school going? What about the boys? and stuff like that. At first I answered a bit monosyllabically, hoping that he would leave me alone, but he clearly had no intention to do so. After a few minutes, he even asked if I would allow him to shoot some more pictures, because I looked like a nymph, and he would like to preserve me forever. Of course I refused, and now something changed in his behaviour. His whole appearance became harder, and he said with a creepy and cold voice, and I'll never forget this sentence, You are really stupid for a naked little girl all alone in the forest. 
At this point, I became scared as hell, jumped up and ran into the forest, leaving all my stuff behind. He didn't try to follow me, but was just sitting there and laughed. I came back after lurking for about two hours to get my stuff. He was gone and left most things behind, except for my shirt and bikini top. I grabbed all my stuff, tried to cover myself with my skirt, and ran home as fast as I could. I never told my parents, but after that, I never visited the meadow again. And to the creepy old man who destroyed my paradise, please, let's never meet again. I was in my early thirties, and had been grieving the loss of my partner a few years earlier. So I regularly went walking alone with my two dogs. One was a bold little pug, and the other a ridgeback cross, but was a total wuss. I lived in a beautiful place, a temperate rainforest in a mountainous area of southern Australia. Many creeks and lots of tree fern forests. It's also sparsely populated due to the terrain, and on this occasion I was walking around the grassy oval by the creek on the outskirts of a small mountain village. Dealing with the grief had been difficult, and I often enjoyed a drink and a joint on these walks. It was time out for me though. I took a seat by the oval, cracked my bevo and sparked up, watching the dogs do their thing just sniffing about. I'd been chilling for a few minutes when I noticed an old guy walking his dog across the oval. I can see he's smoking and has a beer in his hand. My kind of person. As he gets closer, our dogs meet and play, and we soon get to chatting. I recognize his accent. He's from Liverpool, England. He's about 60 and lives with his elderly mother in this town. We're just chatting away for a good half hour, having a nice time on this cool autumn day. He's an interesting guy, so we plan to maybe catch up for a coffee next time I'm in the area. He doesn't have a mobile, so he writes down his home phone number for me on a scrap of paper. Cool, new friend. So conversation turns to when and how he came to Australia. 11 years ago, he arrives, he tells me. I ask what prompted the move. Suddenly, it gets weird. He killed a guy, stabbed him in Liverpool, fled the country and came here. You heard that right. What the hell? So I wind things up pretty quickly now, but still trying to make it seem casual and normal. Hustle the dogs in the car, tell the dude that we'll catch up, and hightail it out of there. It's been at least five years since this incident, but I haven't been back to that area since. Just in case, I run into that murderous scouse again. It was a chilly December morning. I hiked down pre-dawn, taking about an hour and a half to go three miles off the beaten trails. I got to my nests about a half hour before sunrise and started to settle in. The wind kicked up and a fog rolled in that was thicker than milk. Within a few minutes, my visibility was five feet. I'm sitting tight huddled up against the freezing wind, when I start to hear twigs snapping close to me. For no apparent reason, what is normally a rapturous sound, indicative of an imminently successful hunt, sent a frosty chill down my spine. I chambered around into my lever action 3030 as quietly as I could, and lay flat on my back, tucked against a fallen tree. The rustling was moving closer through the fog, but I couldn't see anything. The sun was starting to peak over the mountains to the east, and visibility was starting to increase. The rustling of twigs and leaves was sporadic, sometimes directly in front of me, sometimes behind or beside me. And I remember laying there, rifle across my chest, thinking to myself, how silly it would be to react like such a coward. I rationed with myself that bears and mountain lions are a rarity to see where I was, 
and I had likely stumbled into a herd of whitetails that had bedded down. I decided to sit up. The rustling stopped immediately. It was fully dawn by now. I was looking through the fog for the outline of my prey, which I had assured myself was literally all around me. It wasn't. Seemingly nothing was. By now, the fog had faded away, and it was apparent to me that I was alone in those woods. I hunted all day without seeing so much as a squirrel. Around three in the afternoon, after fighting the wind in an abnormally cold day, and not wanting to hike up by flashlight, I decided it was time to make it back to the trunk. Walking out of those woods was the most uneasy I have ever felt. Lawfully, once you make it back onto the trail, you're supposed to clear the chamber of your rifle. Not that day. What is normally a stroll through the woods, I undertook with the seriousness of an animal being stalked. I would walk, then stop, then listen. I never heard or saw anything during my retreat, but I could feel eyes on me. I was about a hundred feet away from my truck when I rounded the last corner and saw, hanging at eye level from a tree, a noose, a stuffed bear in a blaze orange jacket. I'm a giant, broad-shouldered outdoorsman, but that one shook me something fierce. This is something that happened to me and a friend as kids, and is more of a disturbing discovery than a disturbing person. We were probably between 11 to 14 at the time, and it was in the middle of summer. It was also something I didn't really come to understand until much later in life, when there was no way to resolve what he and I had seen. My house was in a valley. There were a few houses along the streets with it, but the hills on either side were undeveloped forest back then. Me and my friend would hike up the hill behind my house through a few miles of woods and out to the other side where there was a neighborhood that had a farm stand style shop with local honey and a bunch of cheap candy. We also just hung out in the woods a lot and would tell each other scary stories as we headed back home. None of them were all that scary looking back on it, the ones I can remember anyway. But younger me was always a little spooked on the walk back to the house. One dusk when we were heading back for the day, I spotted a bit of white in a mound of moss. As a kid, I was always looking for interesting stuff to collect and take home, so I was immediately ready to go and dig out the moss. When I did, I found a pelvis bone. It had probably been there a long time, and I remember it was pockmarked and dirty, worn away slightly from time. I was pretty scared for a second, but I remembered that all sorts of animals have pelvis bones, and this one must be from a deer or something. In my childish need to know it all, and jumping at my first non-frightening possibility, I told my friend it was a deer pelvis. We marvelled at it, but put it back because I knew my dad would be mad if I brought back old deer bone. I forgot about it for a long time. Many, many years went by. But eventually I learned more about the shape of human bones opposed to animals. I remember the shape I found quite clearly. It was almost certainly a human bone, and the size wouldn't have been an adult. I wonder what else was in the mound, who it might have been, and if my finding could have given someone some closure. I went back to look for it twice, thinking I might remember the part of the woods it had been in, but I never found it again. This happened about 15 years ago back in Mexico. Me and my dad, along with some friends, were out in the woods gathering firewood. An old dirt road used mainly by cattle and ranchers. No other traffic that far out. Ten minutes later, this nice new truck with tinted windows coming from the opposite direction stops about 25 feet in front of my dad's truck. We could hear somebody crying in the truck. Most likely a woman, but I'm unsure. But me being ten didn't think much about it and continued to grab fallen branches. The truck just stopped, but no one left the vehicle. 
My dad told us that was enough for the day, and it was getting dark. All the older guys in the group seemed to know something was up, and jumped in the truck in a hurry. I even got my finger smashed on the door because of it. But again, I didn't think much of it aside from my finger getting bloodied. I remember my dad driving fast. They talked and murmured, but it was grown-ups talk to me, and all I could think about was the finger and the pain. When I got back to the town, my dad pounded a few beers and they talked. Several years later, when I was in my early twenties, that memory came back, and I connected the dots to what we'd witnessed. I'd never felt so much fear in my life before. To this day, the scariest thing that ever happened to me is that. I don't have the guts to bring it up to my dad, but I'm pretty sure it was some sort of cartel-related deal. But for some reason, they decided we didn't see anything. Also, this is because back in the day and in my area, you never really heard of crime like that. The only crime was cartel on cartel, super secretive crime. So I'm sure that whoever was inside probably had something to do with them. If it was cartel related at all, that is. There's a good chance it could have been something else entirely. But I can only imagine what my dad felt having me and his friends with him there, and seeing something that we were not supposed to see, it could have gone terribly wrong for all of us. I'm not a hunter, but when I was around 14 or 15, I went with my cousins and brother to go check out some land my cousin's family friend bought to fish on. The land was a good few acres, and located right next to their very large suburban neighborhood in Georgia. All you need to do was pull onto a curb in the neighborhood and take a small dirt path across a lake. And after a small turn, the path ran about a mile in a straight line down the middle of the property to a larger lake. When we went, we took a golf cart since nobody wanted to walk and pulled onto the property. After taking the small turn on the left onto the main path, we all just froze. Walking towards us at the opposite end of the path, there was a man with a jacket and a ski mask on. We all saw him. He wasn't holding anything. He wasn't running. And he wasn't speaking. We stopped the golf cart, but we couldn't turn around on the path since it was so thin and there was foliage to both sides of us. The person was still at least a half a mile down the path, just walking, but we were still terrified. Also, it didn't help that the oldest in our group was 16 and the driver was 12. Despite being young, however, my cousin put the golf cart in reverse, which makes the loudest high-pitched whine ever, and reversed the entire quarter mile pedal to the metal which is pathetically slow in an electric golf cart. When we told his parents, all of the adults came out with us to look over, as well as set up two plot watchers. They had to see if they spotted anything. There was nothing on the cameras, and they still have never seen anyone in those woods since then, despite hunting there all the time. Me and my friends were going through this trail at night, in a very dense forest. Everyone went quiet for literally no reason. I asked what was wrong, and everyone said they just felt strange, like something bad was about to happen. It sure did, because I stopped in the middle of the road, just at the very edge of the darkness where my lights were. A very weird figure began to run from one side to the other. It was not human. I will say that, just because it didn't look like someone running. It was a shadowy figure, and it ran across in a very fluid motion. I don't know if my eyes were playing tricks on me, but I asked my friends and they said they all saw it. Now here's the most stupid thing I ever did as a skeptic of the paranormal. I got out my car, immediately, complete silence. No birds, nothing. It's pitch black. 
I hear a crumple of leaves in the distance, so I got my phone's flashlight out and pointed it in that direction. What I saw next, I have nightmares about, and I rarely talk about it. It was absolutely just something that shouldn't have happened. I saw an arm around a tree in the distance. It wasn't human. At all. Then it disappeared. I said nothing, and couldn't feel anything. I casually walked back to the car, and didn't say a word to my friends. I put my foot down as fast as possible, got on a main road and connected up with the motorway. My friends asked me what happened multiple times. I pulled into a service station, turned back and just said, I saw an arm wrapped around a tree that wasn't human. We hardly talk about it, and it is the creepiest thing ever. There's a spot in the Pines Barren in South Jersey with a monument to Emilio Carranza, known as the Mexican Lindbergh. He was an exceptional pilot and lost his life when he encountered an electrical storm and his plane crashed into the Barrens. If you're not familiar with the Pine Barrens, it's literally one million acres of nothing but pine trees, little lakes, and trails, and the home of the Jersey Devil, of course. The story goes that if you're out near the Carranza Monument on the anniversary of the crash, you can hear his plane struggling vainly to stay in the air, or if it's after dark, see the lights of his plane. So one year we had nothing better to do and decided to see if it were true. We head out to the monument, which is about 10 miles from the nearest road, and sit around and wait. After a while, we start to hear the sound of a propeller plane, which, no big deal, there are plenty of small airports around, so that isn't exactly creepy. It starts to get weird though. When it became clear that the noise wasn't getting any closer or further away, it was just a constant drone, as if you were standing near a plane idle on the runway, and it didn't stop. We were out there for an hour or so just listening. It was crazy. <laughs> 